Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast. This week we are going to have Charlie Schultz on here. Uh, he's running a little late, but he will be joining us here in a little bit. Um, uh, pretty crazy week uh, we've had here. I know I've had a pretty wild, uh, pretty wild week um, of uh, traveling and all kinds of other things. So I'm more to tell you guys about that when I get back. I assure you. Um, we have this uh, trip uh, I'm taking up to Portland. Um, just got to Portland. Uh, a couple hours ago, uh, yeah, went actually went to go see a, um, a really cool large extraction facility. Uh, I was not allowed to film, uh, but uh, it was really cool to go see a. So this is an incubator. Um, uh, it was really neat. Uh, this guy invited me to to come in and, and check it out. And um, so these guys uh, think of it like an office or a giant warehouse. If it was cut up into like eight or ten little sections, and each one's doing a different type of extract. And they're all operating under one license uh, and um, they work together with like a distribution company. And I thought it was a really interesting model, to, uh, a way for real small producers, mom and pop people, people just starting, you know, trying to get started um, to finally have an easy means to get off the ground, an easy ways of, of taking care of the property, the licensing um, and all the, the, the hassle part of the industry um, so that you can kind of ease into it. You can focus on what you need to do. Uh, you know, get your foot in the door and then focus on, you know, moving up to, to being that, you know, separate uh, in a separate building and whatnot. So I thought that was just a really cool concept and something I hadn't been exposed to before. And just uh, something that I think would be real, you're going to see more and more of in the United States uh, as you see stuff take off. Maybe not, maybe some more in the short term than the long term, but it was just really cool to see a bunch of different types of people. One guy was doing BHO stuff. One guy was doing ethanol stuff. One guy was doing Oh, he wasn't making BHO, but he was working with it to make something else. And um, it was just neat to see all these different little, everyone was doing something wildly different, but it was all cannabis related. It was just kind of neat. It was like going to Santa's pop workshop, you know? <laughs> nice. You know, you say it's only, Steve, you say it's only short term. Uh, I can see it being long term. It's like everybody buys their jelly at Ralph's or Albertsons or you know Walmart, whatever. But you still got a lot of people you know, that make that jelly for the county fair, you know, whatever. I'm not so sure it's going to go away. You look at like the oh, craft yeah. beer. I, I, I think uh, some of those folks are going to be there to stay. Oh, yeah. It's gonna, you're going to see a connoisseur market open up. And that's what you're seeing a lot with um, a lot of states. And I know Canada has a micro farm license. Uh, coming up in July or uh, for recreational. I know a lot of states, California has a couple that has a micro farm license as well. Um, so you're, you are seeing, a, you know, at least a, a space being put up. Granted, it's, I don't agree if it's being regulated properly, but um, so let's go over introductions. I apologize. We kind of jumped in a little bit. Um, uh, we have uh, Tommy with us. Yeah, uh, Tommy J here, uh, Old Park Rose. Uh, Glad to be on the show. Uh, I missed you guys the last two weeks. Had some uh, personal kind of stuff going on, but really glad to be back. I want to see uh, catch up with everybody and see what's going on. Cool. And we got uh, Roger with us as always. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, Roger. Hey, Roger. hey Marty. <laughs> yeah, we got everybody here tonight, kind of, sort of. I mean, except for Brain Grow. Oh, he's here. He's just on chat. I am oh, he's on chat. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Don't forget fish. Oh yeah, fish isn't here either. Oh, fish yeah, is, fish. I wonder what fish is up to. Because our panel knows. just keeps growing. It's awesome. I know. We're gonna at some point. I'm gonna have to switch. I'm gonna have to once I have a good internet connection at the at the house. I'll have to switch to something that allows me to do more than ten people, and and y'all have to switch to Skype or something. But um, I, I I can handle that. But yeah, it's pretty cool that we're getting this. Uh, I'm glad to have Good Mr. Goal. Green Gene. Glad to have Mr. Green Jeans here again this yeah. week. Jeansgarden.com. I got a couple oh. of girls over here too. In case we get lonely. Some pretty <laughs> ladies. You can show and tell. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Last week I was I had just driven back from Northern California. I was like all beat and tired. Sorry if yeah, I didn't I, contribute much. But... I, I do think we're gonna switch the after show into a separate uh separate show if we're going to do one in the future because it was kind of funny having like a six hour episode <laughs> but it was cool there was a lot of like random weed talk afterwards you know it was a few tangents but well i um, talked to the fella with the with that, that uses the urine and the in the coffee until like five in the morning 
after you guys left. We talked for another hour or two. He was, he was quite something. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right offhand. I, like I said, I just woke up from a nap. But yeah, we we had the after hour show. Then you guys all left, and that guy came on like five minutes before everybody else was ready to leave. And uh, I talked to him for a couple hours after that. Roger, let me see if I'm hearing you. I, I'm getting old here. So, You're talking about somebody who pisses in their coffee? Urine in their I'll coffee? i you that they use urine and coffee and some other things to make an organic nutrient for their plants. And, Man, that, sounds, and they, that, that sounds even too wild then for California, dude. That's, no. You do a two week. It's viable. I mean, he does a viable way. He, he, yeah, what you do ahead, is you, Steve. what you do is you pee in a bottle and you let it sit for two weeks. <laughs> you guys are for real. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. hundred percent. Actually, there's, there's nutrients sold <laughs> on the market that are derived from cow <laughs> ammonia. Uh, they're they're pure ammonia. ammonia. Yeah. Crystallized ammonia is derived from usually cow urine or pig urine. Uric acid. We're just Uric using acid. fish urine, you guys. This is the yeah, we're just, yeah. So, but okay. I, I myself have used that on organic gardens where, oh, you know, cool. you pee, ferment it for two weeks, put it in your compost pile. I don't put it on with the plants directly, but I'll put it in a compost or something like that and let it work into the soil mix and break down. But you wouldn't put, you know, okay. you can put it on a garden. Yeah, you know, you could not, absolutely put it into a garden. From a bunch of, bunch of rednecks at a tailgate party, right? <laughs> no, no. Pissing on okay. the, no, it's on the compost Fair pile. Enough. Fair I enough. mean, it's attracting the same nitrifying bacteria that we we do with fish here, and it's not it's not really any different. The input attracts what is going to eat it, and that's the microbe you get. It's just like you know when people say, "Oh, well, you can use milk as a plant food." I'm like, oh, well, you can, but you know, it would probably be better if you just fermented it and turned it into labs and added it that way. I just but still, adding raw milk to your, you know, like to a tea or something like that would still attract labs eventually, but just in lower numbers and not as effective. And you know, so it's a, you know, it's a sliding scale. But your input determines what you're going to attract. So in this case, you know, nitrifying bacteria is going to be the result, whether it's our pee or pig pee or fish pee or. Well, as, as the guy who works in the extraction side of this, I know what happens when when you press things down. And I didn't understand where the sources were from. So like for some reason when I heard Roger talking about it, I'm thinking like, oh my God, the dude peed in this thing and made this stuff, you know? And I'm just like, okay, now you got your Xanax in there, you got your this, that, and the other thing. You know, we eat a, a, a different deal. And I know from concentrating stuff down, all those cooties get concentrated. So I'm, I'm totally happy with pig uh, pee rather than what I was thinking was I was like, no, you're not going to do that and put that on the girls because I'm going to find that in the lab and it's not going to look good. <laughs> yeah, well, he was real serious. He had a bunch of, uh, Mr. Green Jeans would have loved it because he was had a bunch of plants growing in small pots too, you know, and I mean, he was showing his plants and he showed, the you know, his bottle of nutrients and, you know, and he, he was smoking it and, uh, you know, we just, we just went on and on, and it was pretty interesting uh, what he's come up with, you know, because uh, that's all he does. He, you know, it's like it seemed like he was just in this little room, you know, like uh, in his own little world in there. And uh, it was we we talked to tell, but we talked about everything too. We didn't just talk about that, but he went over and over about it, you know. And he we he came out of chat. He was in chat room last week, and then we invited right. him on. He wanted to get on. I mean, everybody was ready to wrap up the after show. And then he, you know, he, like, here, we're ready to sign off. And here comes another guest. <laughs> so let's invite him on sometime in the future. Well, I'll he might him. be there tonight. I don't know. Yeah. I sent him an invite to see oh, where those two guys nice. that joined at the end of nice. Yeah, because, I mean, live, it'd be a hoot to let him have a segment live and let hear people what he, because we get it on the forum all the time. Some guy comes on and talks about using urine in his garden and everybody starts freaking out. But if you know oh, what you're I doing, just, you, you actually, I've heard of it many, many times. It's a very it's a highly viable. Straight on the plants. Water. Might, a, might hurt him a little your bit. Nutrients, but, you know, there's a lot of. Only in containers. Doesn't. Outdoors. My, my, my head right away went to like the guys going out and he's pissing in the pot. You know. No, no, well, you don't do that. I know what's in there. <laughs> Plants that are already large and they're outdoors love a little pee. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> it's really not going to hurt them at all because soil organisms are going to turn that into available nutrients for them, no, no problem. I mean, I think in a container, you could probably overwhelm a plant with pea. You know, it might not be the best thing because it might have a lot of ammonia in it and it's pretty alkaline, right, or something. But um, but on the other hand, in the ground, the soil organisms get a hold of it right away. And certainly if it's a big plant, you know, it's not a, not a little baby sensitive plant, something nice and large or a tree. It's going to love it. But I, I think we're... You know, outdoors, you, you notice the trees that say thank you when you go pee, when you pee against them. <laughs> They're like, ah, oh, thanks a lot. Especially now, you know what? I have a theory. We, we've we been pumping so much uh, CO2 into the fucking atmosphere, right? That's uh, it's kind of an imbalance, right? So a lot of nutrients for a lot of plants. And so it's suddenly available. Their main nutrient is now much more available than it used to be. So I think it's putting a stress on the next available nutrient, which is nitrogen. Plants and you know the t the wise old trees, they're like, oh, thank you, human. I needed that pee pee. You guys have been putting too much CO two in the air lately. We need we need more <laughs> nitrogen, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Sorry, I'm, am I going off? <laughs> we we oh, no. go pee against the tree. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. I was just talking to you. Sitting here rolling this joint. Trying to get away from I, I, I agree with you there. I like uh I kind of like marking my territory. Yeah. That too. <laughs> that too. Yeah. Lots of good reasons for it. Um yeah, it, it probably keeps away uh, deer and stuff. You live in the right in certain neighborhoods, you know. I'm yeah, sure. for sure. I think so. But, uh, but yeah, P is good. Now, mine's triple strength. It keeps the rats and the cockroaches away. <laughs> I drink enough coffee. coffee. Probably scare off lots of shit. That sounds, like a plan. that sounds like a plan. Because you can smell it. You drink enough coffee, you can smell it in your pee. Look at all the pretty <laughs> stuff. That, do, TMI. <laughs> all these pretty pictures that every time Marty talks, look at all that shit, dude. Beautiful. I, I thought that was better Fantastic. than my, my ugly mug dude. up there all the time. I, we put it up as the main one, but then uh, when you just have, we have that running as a video feed all the time, you can't tell who's talking. So that's why we switched it back to have it go back and forth. But, but yeah, that's, uh, let's see, that's some Gorilla Glue. That's a nice little new guy. I'm just yeah. uh, rolling up some of that right now. I'm just rolling up the joint. <coughs> All right. Mm. There. Respect. Mm. That was Respect. the indoor you guys were. I can practically. I can almost smell it uh, through the picture. I can. It's right here. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, yeah. uh, Marty, right now I am living vicariously through you. Just yeah. You okay. <laughs> Oh no, you're not dry, are you? <laughs> oh no, 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 it's just oh, not here. Oh, okay. That's just fucking just pretty. <laughs> variety is the spice of life. I mean, let's oh, no, I, I understand. There's variety, and then there's dry. That's just painful. Oh, no, yeah, no. <laughs> I've been dry for about. I've been dry for three or four, three or four weeks until this Ooh, week. No. Well, you live on the east coast, so I can kind of yeah. understand. That. It's a little different story. Well, right? I usually am not dry, but I mean, it's just the way things happen this time. Right. So this is my first outdoor grow with some of the things you see there. That's a Jacarar outdoor aquaponics. That was so piney and tasty. Really enjoyed that one. Cool structure. Turned all red instead of like purple or yellow, like really bright yellow and red. And then that's a Platinum Delight. It's a bright purple. Wow. Good stuff. That's nice. Good stuff. I have thousands of pictures. I just threw some of these in here so I could have something up there. Maybe I'll change them out more often. I've been the same last time. Beautiful. But entertaining, none the least. Hey, Marty, you definitely are not one of those people where they would say big hat, no cattle. You got all cattle. That's <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. I like cattle. Yeah. Some pretty cows. Yeah. I was just going back through when I when I created this folder, I was having to pull a bunch of pictures off and just like looking at the sheer volume. I think I'm up to like uh, close to like 300 gigs of just straight pictures. <laughs> Merry Christmas. So it's a, uh, I take a lot of pictures. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it, especially the. That's okay. I'm, Marty, I'm a voyeur. I, I'll admit it. I'm a garden voyeur. <laughs> I I love my bud pool. That's, that's for sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll look at the stuff. I'll start breathing heavy and everything, dude. Yeah, it's I porn unless it's roots. So okay, that's um, like it's more like fashion photography. It's only porn if you're shooting the roots. Uh, all so, right. So you say. I, I get what you're saying, but yeah, but the sugar's roots. pretty, man. Sugar's that's pretty. pretty. <laughs> I love the shoot. when you shoot the roots. The the people roots who lift their DWC up like that. Like that. that indoor That's dual root zone, man. They just they took up the whole bed. Like I thought, I didn't drill as many holes in the bottom, so I thought the like maybe the roots wouldn't you know go through it as much and it wouldn't have as many roots in the bed. <clears throat> not not even close. I mean, it just split out the side of the pot, like just completely grew out. The whole bed was just covered in roots. Like all the hydrogen was all grown together. It was just a mat of roots in the whole the whole thing. So it did not work as I anticipated, but you know, still still turned out just fine. And uh, I think I'll probably just count on having to do that is not, you know, just figure the roots are gonna go nuts when they get out of the pot. There's not really a whole lot I can do about it, just to count for it moving forward. Cause, can't argue with roots the result, that's for sure. Yeah, roots are tenacious. But you can see the pots there a little bit on that last picture. Uh -huh. I don't know if I can go back or not. No, I can't control it right now. But the um, but yeah, in that one picture, you could see you know where they're embedded in, in the bed. The bed is much bigger than the pot, <clears throat> and the roots just covered the whole thing, end to end, top to bottom, just a mat, like a, a mattress of roots and hydrogen. And that that was it. So I spent a lot of time cleaning those out, and I have uh, ten more of these Gorilla Glue uh, plants that are going to go in, um, uh, six into flower, and then have some for veg and cut some clones off of. So hopefully, I'll have that set up by next week, and we can take a look. Fun, fun. Good work, sir. Good work. Thank you. Beautiful. I don't know if you guys saw, I started, uh, I got some girls going again, which is awesome. It's like so mentally uh, relieving, I guess, in a lot of weird ways. So. Well, every guy should have a harem. That's my right? thought. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, treat them nice, you know, beat them when they need it. You know, twist them around the net when they need it. And give them the love and attention they need. And <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm super stoked. My uh, my blue hash is already rocking. Some of them are already like this big. I'm not even lying; they're fucking huge. After they're on day eight, I think today or day nine. Something like that. These are from uh, seed. From seed, yes. From seed. And are they the fastest germinators I've ever had? Are they feminized seeds or are they um? straight they're straight yeah they're butch they're butch they're butch but the whole the whole <laughs> row of 10 is growing super fast so i i doubt that they're all boys you know normally though i, I do hear what you're saying though uh if you have ones that are super fast germinators good chances are that they're a boy no 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 i don't no, think no. so i think that oh, yeah fact, well, well just, i'll say just... i will say at least with the equatorial strains i'll say that I used to get fooled all, you know, all the time. I, every time I think I got it figured out, it's the other sex. It never fails. It, I don't care. We could grow. I'll have one three feet tall and four of them one and a half feet tall and the three foot one, I'll say it's a freaking male. It turns out to be a female. You know? As long as that doesn't happen <laughs> at the corner bar, you're fine. Yeah. yeah. 
I've seen plants that always make tiny little uh, seeds and uh, not necessarily very strong uh, coats, even if you feed them well and stuff like that. They just they just make wimpy seeds. And uh, the seed themselves, even if it germinates real strong, in the very beginning, the little plant is kind of little looking. And m later on might, you know, grow up to be normal, catch up. But it's just like kind of a feature of the mother's makes tiny seeds. And, you know, you've seen uh, other plants that make gigantic seeds too, you know, just germinate and just go, bah, you know. <laughs> so there's that. And, and it's not even related to the germination ratio. You know, it's just the, the shape the mom see, the way, the shape of her flower or whatever. Do you work with the gels? Huh? Do you do the kind of... The gel? uh, The gels, yeah. And, and saving your stock your DNA and stuff in the gel and you can pop it off and get a clone. Do you do, do, you do that kind of work too? Talking about tissue culture. No. No, I just oh. no, I just make the cuts the regular way. But uh -huh. um but that's a, but it's an interesting idea. It would be cool for uh, cuz I generally just make one uh cut from each previous one. I'm usually most of the clones that I've saved are one that are saved are select breeding plants and stuff like that or they might become later. You know There's what I mean? So or, you know. a really interesting article on somebody who's working with gels. And apparently what they're doing, and, and I didn't understand it, that's why I come on things like this to learn from guys like you. But from what it sounded like his direction was, I'm identifying these good strains, I'm keeping them in the gel because I can keep them so much longer in this stage of their growth rather than losing through drift of cloning and cloning you know bringing up a bringing up a mother and, and it was oh i've never seen that I mean, with, I got, um, with doing i've kept um, clones for years huh? i don't think there is i don't think there is any kind of degeneration thing if there is i think the macintosh apples are going to be in trouble at about 300 years old now but um yeah no well, i don't think there's any such that's good yeah. yeah i don't think there's any such thing as clone degeneration <laughs> Well, I've never seen it. I mean, uh, I, my well, favorite plant. I got her when she was 14 years old, and well, I, I, I got a cone here that's 14. Yeah, at least. yeah, a couple. And they're one. Like, it's one of the most plants. vigorous clones you've ever seen. Yeah, Jesus, I know. It's just like Lazarus. Every time it would just raise from the dead, no matter what you did to her. Yeah. Oh, it's just because uh, you know some plants are just really vigorous and. It's just, it doesn't matter. You know, I don't keep a, a mother clone and only take ones from that. I just go one from the next, from the next, from the next. Generation so that plant's generation. been done. That's how I did it, yeah. I've had it, yep. you know, it must be thousands of generations <laughs> of clone generations, if you want to call it that. I, I don't know what that is. I don't count that. I only count seed generations. Mm -hmm. I do count those. <laughs> and actual generations where you cross a male and female. But what does uh, everybody think? Is that... Is that a good method where, because that's how I did it. I just don't you know, know if it's right or not. You know, what would be useful would be to be able to keep the clone sort of on hand to keep its tissue availability for breeding, because that's exactly what some of these plants that I have that are 12, 15 years old are valuable for. They're just fantastic. They're plants that I've already, that are already proven breeding plants. You already know that when you cross that with anything, it's going to, kick its, you know, uh, give its traits into the thing that you cross it with. So, you, you know what I mean? So, you know, you want to keep that. And, uh, but it would be cool if there was a way to, because, you know, a plant that takes up room, actually one of them, for example, I, I'm thinking of this Jack Herrera, which is such a wonderful plant, is so vigorous growing <laughs> and it grows so fast that it, uh, you know, it immediately takes over <laughs> And it, it looks great because you turn over the clone generations quick, but because I just really uh, only I don't necessarily want to grow it all the time. For, well, some guys you know, are banking. Them. Some guys are banking. I don't need as much weed. <laughs> genetics in the gel. I think that's a pretty. I mean, you know, it, it's it an interesting idea. Nice. And yeah. I don't know. You know, that that's this is not my daily wick. That's why I bring it up with you guys. I mean, mm. if there was, especially if there was a way to like kind of store, to make a whole bunch of little plants or to, or to keep the, to hold the tissue of the plant, 
you know, really reliably in kind of in suspension or whatever. That's what's that's what they do with it. It's kind of like zombie marijuana. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 there's uh, some research that you can go look at. They did it with the uh, redwoods or something like that, and they will. And, and they just have these little test tubes and they're putting this little tiny piece of plant in there, giving it like one watt of power. Oh my God. It's just like, you're just teasing it with photons at that point. And they're, they're, they're hanging this plant in suspension for really, really long times. And then when you want it, you go in there with your scalpel or whatever, you take a smidge off it, you drop it in the next thing. You guess you change your temperatures, change the food, ratio mm -hmm. give it some more uh input of photons and boom you can grow it out and i think that article steve showed me to this guy who's uh trying to get double wrapped uh dna in his plants to hopefully make mutants that make bigger buds uh he, he was maintaining stock you know trade stock that he wants to get going and apparently they can just uh like on tap, just un unleash it and turn it into a plant, and, and for breeding. I think it sounds exciting, but I, I I'm not even qualified to know if I even know the questions to ask of a methodology like that. So the so the so what he's talking about is so um, there's a, a genetic mutation called a poly polyploid. And yeah. A polyploid. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure. So a polyploid yeah. is instead of getting like a round daisy, you get a stretched daisy. So the, the head will look like this of the daisy and rather than like a circle uh, or a circle. And, uh, <laughs> um, and Half a hole. Half a hole. <laughs> <laughs> a double plant. Uh, or, uh, um, uh, so what, what it is is they're taking this crocus. Um, uh, hold on. Focusing. The fall crocus bulbs. They're crushing the fall crocus bulbs. It's from the autumn crocus. Yeah. Uh, colchicine. Yep, colchicine. That's it. Yeah. And then they're taking colchicine from the seeds and the bulbs and, and taking that extract. And they're basically adding a couple drops of that to the water that they soak their seeds in. Like in the video that I have, I just did on my channel where we soak the seeds to pre soak. They put some of the colchicine in there. And what that does is it, it um, changes the way that the plant pairs up its gene sequences. And you can get these super crazy. So instead of your bud looking like a beer can, it looks like a beer can like this instead of a beer can like this. <laughs> it's pretty wild. It makes these fan-shaped buds the, that are really big. The, colchicine has so traditionally been used for a long time on, on a lot of other plants. It's an old thing used in agriculture in on... Uh, to, to as a mutagen, you know, yep. um, so it isn't wasn't first tried on cannabis, but uh, yeah. generally, the idea is that you've got to kill most of your um, plants. So you you probably have to dose the seeds high enough. So you, it's probably good to start with like a hundred seeds, and dose them high enough that you kill a lot of them. You know what I mean? With yeah. enough culture enough culture scene that you're like killing 90 of them and the 10 that survive are going to be or that's traditionally how it's done in other areas and there's a lot of talk about people using it to make triploidy uh you know to make a triploid cannabis and stuff like that it's been in fact arthur connell clark you know in uh um, um marijuana kind of botany book. which was yep. written in the 70s wonderful old book um, I'm pretty sure he talked about it in there. Cut that, and it, the reason why is because it's a, it's an old, old agricultural idea. It's been around. There's an Sorry, old book. What do you say, Steve? There's an old book, Cannabis can, uh, Canasaur, or Cannabis Connoisseur from the 70s that I think was the first time I ever read about it. Uh, yeah. The idea has been around for a while. And, uh, yeah, I had that book. You know, yeah. <laughs> so he's talking about getting that mutant plant, that, that one out of a thousand, that you know, it's the green he's talking about here, and then yeah. once you have that one, then you hold it in the gel, and out of the gel, you just boom, you can just start cranking out, cloning, you know, after that point. Well, I would love Will to you? see it. I would love to see an analysis like on Mr. Green Jeans, double his twins. He's got that, that twins. Oh, strength. you know, they, they, they both came out females, um, once again. And as a matter of fact, um, 
of those GTs. Damn, I should have brought out one. <sighs> probably went over there. I could probably grab one really quick. Oh, um, of oh, the G Remember we G thirteens, you guys are oh yeah, that's yeah. The, the strain from the uh the old government the, supposedly the, the, the legend of the government uh US government strain or whatever. But you know, I got from the seeds in uh, yeah, got the seeds in, in in Prague. So anyway, you know, there was eleven seedlings out of ten seeds, right? <laughs> How do you do that? 11 seedlings out of 10 seeds. That's because, as you know, the one of those seeds was a twin, and that was pretty cool. But here's the deal. They were all females. What's even the chances of 10 females? I Well, okay, if they were feminized, <coughs> but they weren't. They were supposed to be straight. <clears throat> they were supposed to be straight seeds. And uh, they obviously didn't turn out to be straight, right? But here's the kind of funny thing. There's, there's a fair amount of uh, variation. There's quite a bit of variation, uh, more variation than you'd expect from feminized seeds. Although, although you do get a fair amount of variation when you use a female, when you use female pollen from another plant to cross into. You really only get that extreme reduction in variation with feminized seeds when it the plant is actually cell, but sometimes. What is, what is female pollen? A um, plant when you when you take a female plant and you you cause it to make a male flower, either like sometimes a they, silver thing on it or something. Yeah, silver nitrate is the is the classic way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. And, I, I just didn't know what the term meant. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, you know, and some plants are harder to, some plant, the way I see it is that genetically, some plants are obviously a lot easier to, uh, to coax into being hermaphrodites. There is a, uh, the biggest component is genetic because some plants absolutely won't hurt me no matter what you do pretty easily. Other plants are complete fence straddlers and no matter what you do, they're Hermes anyway, because they're from laos or thailand you know cool. it's like, okay, couldn't get a get job it. on the airlines right, right. <laughs> <laughs> total wow. lady boys these guys <laughs> but anyway um so but the, uh, genetically is the main is the main thing about about hermaphrodites obviously but there's also some kind of you know uh you need stress component will do it anyway but, but so the, the classic way to, to really make feminized seeds is to cause the plant to uh, make a female flower with the silver nitrate. And it, it'd be nice if it was a really extremely female plant. And you do occasionally see those. Um, there are such things, I think, as plants that are so female that no matter what you do, you'll never see a male flower on that. And maybe you might know, kill it. So right. basically, social right. justice warrior plants. Yeah, a lot of it's down to okay. stress. You know, this this Oreo plant. I know it's getting to be seven or eight years. I haven't seen a female flower, a male flower, in a long time. It it, it used to occasionally give off um, give off a male flower. It's half Durban poison. You know, it's it's a sativa land race, and uh, you know you would expect that to sometimes have a hermaphrodite flower. And in fact. I think it can. I think it's, you know, and I'm sure it still could, but maybe I just, you know, I, I, I never, I, I really think that one of the things that makes hermaphrodite flowers is feeding plants the wrong kind of food, you know, late in flowering. If they're past peak flowering and you're still giving nitrogen and things like that. And I never do that because, not because I'm so cool and so self-disciplined, but just because I use the really small pots and the plants run out of food, <laughs> you know, and... <laughs> So you know what I mean? It, it, this this guy you can see is getting uh, yellow. A lot of it's got beautiful some green stuff left in there, but a lot of the leaves have gotten quite yellow. Gets it used up. All yeah, but it looks like at that stage, it looks like it's fairly far along, right? How many how many weeks in flower are you there? Oh yeah, but maybe not because this is this is um, this is a ten, at least a ten or eleven weeker indoors. It's half urban poison. It's a pretty long season sativa. So it, it'd probably go another week. It's got, the pistols are still looking pretty good. Um, yeah. And it will solidify, the buds will solidify a little bit too, if I give it a little more time. But, but man, it's still in this little, it's only in one quart pot. <laughs> nice. Big old plant. 
it's a it's a gigantic so you, do, you, you do a lot of turn and burn right huh you do a lot of turn and burn you, you get what it out mean? of the dirt you, you you get it out of the uh dirt and then boom throw it in the flower well, yeah, I only have the, the the vegging light and the flowering light, and the flowering light is continuous. So I just I put the plants in there, and when they're done, I take them out. Yeah, and and uh, so I and a lot of times I don't necessarily notice some of them take longer than others or whatever. I I do know that the Oreo is at least a ten uh, ten weeker maybe. I, I but you do you do like I do. You just let the trichomes and the you let the trichomes tell you when to harvest. You don't really pay attention to. I don't either. I don't really know. Sometimes I go, I'm shit. I said that I'm not sure if it should be ready yet or not. I just keep checking the buds and and sometimes and, uh, I don't really follow how many weeks. I don't keep journals well, or nothing anymore. I just grow until it's ready. You know. I, I, sometimes I, sometimes I just run out of room. I learned a lot about <laughs> that. I learned a lot about that at, at Frenchie's class, but before we get totally onto that topic, I wanted to circle back for a second and just talk about, you were talking a little bit about polypioids and then we were talking about herms and stuff like that in genetics. So a polypioid uh, is another word for a seedless watermelon, for example. Um, the cool thing about polypioids is a lot of them, um, polyploids or whatever they're called, is that they, um, you can't, uh, in most cases, they can't be fertilized. Meaning you could have polyploid um, uh, cannabis medicinal plants growing right next to, say, field hemp that hasn't been pulled for males, and it will not ruin your crop. Or you could have a breeding program going on in the same room that your normal flowering harvest was going on, except for the one or two that weren't poly, you know, that weren't poly, it's a, it's a back cross, so... It just some 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 ideas on, on stuff that you could do. I mean, obviously, it makes it kind of a dead end because you can't then cross it, you know. But yeah, wouldn't uh, that be the same, Steve, for a like a like a like the diva cucumber, a burpless seedless cucumber? Wouldn't that be yep. the same thing? Uh, I'm not sure, but because it's kind of it's kind of like a melon, uh, similar to a melon. Um, but I that's what I grow. I grow those divas. They don't have any seeds in them. I actually have a female plant like that. The one I think I showed a couple of weeks ago. It was afterwards, I'm pretty sure. Roger, you, I think you saw it. Was, or I don't know, maybe you guys saw it. They had it in the big, it wasn't in a quarter. The big it was one gallon, gallon pot, the giant one gallon yeah. pot. <laughs> uh huh. Her, her name is her name's Chill Jill. That's such an unusual clone that she has a name of her own, too. And uh, yeah, Chill Jill, because she's like a Jack Herrera. She's a Jack Herrera derivative. And uh, and uh, that plant is very difficult to pollinate. It has some kind of mutation on the pistils, which also makes it really unique and obvious. No one could ever claim it to be a different plant. It's it, you can uh, spot it at a glance when it's flowering, or even when it's vegging. It's got a lot of unusual traits that way. But but the uh, but right on the pistils, there's something. They a lot of them have a, maybe a club. There's a club to the end of it or something like that. Like it's a, there's some, some kind of mutation on the pistols, and it took me years even to get seeds off it. And I've never got more than a sprinkling of seeds on it. I've I've literally dusted the entire plant with pollen before, and gotten six seeds when there was visible pistols. Well, it never really gets that many pistols. It kind of has a low ratio, like a, a kind of look indica look, maybe. But still, it, it seems to be unpollinatable, which is like, what? <laughs> I've never seen that before. And as far as I know, it's not polyploid, but <laughs> could be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I think so. That was us. It can happen naturally without introducing it. Could. Without it. It could, it could be, we could already have genetics with quite a bit of other people could have done the experiments and it could be continued along. Um, yep. So there very well might be plants with polyploid genetics running around already. Yeah, there's um, a handful this, of strains that, uh, and there's one or two bigger companies that we're working on. Uh, uh, damn it, there was like two or three strains out there that were, were um, basically designed around that from, from clones. Um, and you would expect the polyploid plant to be extremely vigorous like that too. You would expect oh, yeah. it to be very fast growing. Oh yeah, if it has those extra genes, it's gonna go crazy most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Also, they'll grow, kind of, um, 
they'll go kind of corly or corkscrew or a corkscrew leaves. Their leaves aren't always flat. Sometimes they're kind of funky. It's another. Oh, I've seen lots. Of, I've seen plants like that. And it, of course, you know, tri trifoliar plants and plants with double stems that are trying to grow together. Oh, from the like twins that twins that almost the same plant. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I have to tell you all something. Soundtrack? We'll have to get him back on soon. But Donald has had his. Remember, we talked about Donald doing his mother tree with like eight different strains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he he successfully yes. grafted the first clone onto the to the stem. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And he's already got he's got one and I, and we talked but we were talking about business the other day we didn't get into that but I know about three weeks ago he successfully grafted the first clone onto it and he's moving on with that and this is a plant that he's re, he harvested and revegged so the stem is a is a, from a harvested plant not a main and he's next going to do a mainline plant to do it but he went ahead and just for shits and giggles he decided he's going to start grafting on this plant that he harvested keep it going keep because it's already got established root zone and he's a, he's already successfully got the first graft on so by the end of the year we ought to have us a a multi-strain mother tree you know mother bush or what you know mother plant you know so it's well, I, bush. I thought i'd throw that out a multicultural you know. bush <laughs> yeah to call it coexist cannabis can't we all just get away i like multicultural bushes there you go yeah. A lot of that in Florida going around. <laughs> um, so I actually got a chance to go to Frenchie Cannoli's hash class over the weekend. That was super awesome. Um, I learned a whole bunch uh, about how to, clean up bubble hash, how to clean up bubble hash and uh, uh, some different dry sift techniques I hadn't been exposed to. Um, just a whole bunch of great stuff. If anyone ever gets a chance to go to one of Frenchie's classes, it was amazing. They had an open hash Frenchie. bar, all you, open hash bar, all you can smoke. Half of it's Frenchie's. Um, doesn't really get better than that, <laughs> for real. That's um, worth it alone, right? He's a master. He's an absolute master. Oh, yeah. Can you sign up and just go to the hash bar all day? That seems like. I'm sure you could. There was two. There was two, two or three people there that had paid a lot of money and flown from other places that were blacked out on the couch by the end of this. Like, I don't want to learn. I'm, I'm just here for the hash bar. <laughs> and then there was a um, uh, Frenchie comes out at the end with an eight hose Syrian hookah that's like four feet tall. And he oh yeah, I saw hose. your video. It's like half an ounce of hash on there. Or an ounce yeah. of hash on there, and just we all spoke together. It was the coolest shit, you know. And it was like his some of his best hash, but we all smoked together with coconut. It was just such a great experience, and um, yeah. So he teaches these classes occasionally in San Francisco, and I think there's one in Barcelona coming up and stuff. So be sure to check him out if you get a chance. You know, he's going to be doing one on dry sift technique um, coming up in uh, sometime in the next couple of months here. Dry sifting. Yeah, so it'll be like a Moroccan and Afghan hash class, mm -hmm. whereas this was just like a uh, how he does his temple balls and all. Really neat. So he does a, he has a really cool way of doing water hash gentler. So he'll do like he'll take him like the better part of six hours to do about two pounds worth of bubble to process it uh, real gently and slowly. But man, does it come out insane! And uh, as I had gently cold... and slowly in ice water, in cold water, right? In cold water, no? yeah. cold water, cold yeah. water, yeah. Yeah, you want the water to do the friction, not the ice. The ice will break up the material and add contaminant that you then have to work back out on the back end. Yeah. You know, you know, I I, I dip a lot of plants a lot of times. These these kind of plants are like are really easy to turn upside down into a into yeah. a. You know, so like if I have problems with insects and things like that or whatever, I just, you know, dunk them in water. And, and, uh, and you know, uh, a... I've noticed that no, you know, you would think at first I was like worried about that. Oh my God, am I going to be washing the resin off? You know, but I, the other no. day I was looking in a five gallon bucket and I dipped a whole bunch of plants 
And I was thinking, you know, if I was knocking any resin off, wouldn't there be, wouldn't there be an oil slick <laughs> here, you know? And there's there's nothing, you know. There's the, the water starts turning green with the, the insects and things like that, or whatever, getting knocked well, off. You or could maybe be something. knocking resin heads off, but they would not form an oil slick because you have yeah. to do something to break the outside uh, chemical barrier on yep. the heads. Well, the yeah. but and when the you pick heads, won't fall off real easily they, until they're ripe, they, which is something I didn't learn until yeah. I was in French. Yeah. Andy, rough. You have to think of I'm them. I'm pretty rough, out. you know, because yeah. I'm. I smoosh the plants up and down pretty good. I don't, I'm not like all, you know, soft in there. I, I swish them up and down to, to knock off any bad buggies and things that might be in there and give, you know, gives them a hard time. Makes, makes things like uh, spider mites, you know, <laughs> knocks yeah. them back to hell. I mean, apples water. stuff too, apples. I, I put them, I put plants in the shower, you know. I put plants in the shower. I put plants in the shower. I put plants in the shower. I love it. I, I put a plastic bag around the pot, so nice. tie it up, and then give it a shower. They smell so good. Lukewarm water, barely lukewarm water, you know. We had a fifty-five gallon. They love you. We had a fifty-five they gallon. Love but the thing, yeah. what my point is that I, I think no re resin gets knocked off. I mean, really, yeah. literally none. A lot of people have said to me, "Oh, don't aren't you worried about washing off the resin?" In it? And I thought about that. I was worried about that. And I think I got into it originally because I was like, I had a seed batch on there and i was like well i don't give a shit you know the seeds are more important than the bud so right. so i just you know so in my well, in my estimation the one thing was worth more than the other so i started doing it but now i would like to tell you that i don't think there's any danger of washing off resin if you're concerned about it that straight water i don't think does anything even warm maybe cold it might and i you know i don't use it cold i use it kind of warm a little bit lukewarm well, even there, if you there's, well, hold on, hold on. there's a guy in chat that actually brought something to you. Says you lose water soluble terps. You actually do not lose water soluble terps. That's actually a Can't. myth. Um, the terpenes are held inside of. There's a membrane that goes around the outside of the terpene head, and that membrane does not break in water. It, uh, right. You can freeze them and shatter it if because there's moisture in there. Yes. If you flash freeze them, you can break them. Um, which is why you, you don't use a ton of ice because you can actually break them that way. But um, the terpenes are actually held inside of it. Think of it like a fruit or like an apple or a grape. Uh, or apple would probably be a better thing because apples are fall from the tree once they're fully ripened. Okay, The trichome head is the same way. It has a sealed barrier that detaches. The same uh, cells that detach uh, an apple from a tree that where it connects are the same cells that are at the edge of that trichome head. It's actually it's designed to fall off when it's ready. Basically, it, it's a, a, a dust protection uh, for the the plant. And if it gets too heavy or the you know it gets fully ripened, it'll drop off so that the younger ones can help protect the plant from from you know that have less shit on them. Basically, um, the membrane so you can, is you can no the membrane is not water permeable. Frenchy actually went through that in detail, and he actually had us. T like taste the water of it and then taste some of the the, the hash there, you, there was no flavor for, in the water of it and we we spent probably four hours grinding that you know swirling that way that weed in that water if it was going to have a taste it would have been after four you know it's basically tea <laughs> and we're talking about washing off the resin or whatever i mean just look at when you when you harvest a plant and you don't wear gloves how you can't wash that shit off your fingers Think about it. You, you. I mean, you can sit there all day and so, under the, they can't wash that off your fingers. So, so the the reason why people. So he he uh, 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 R in chat also brought up. So he says that's why people like to pull the bags out of the water. Actually, so that when you pull the bag out of the water, it lets you work the contaminants out, so they wash right out. Um, so if you can hang the bags so that they're not in water at all with your catch basin underneath, you can actually take your hose and work work the foam on like a fan spray with the boat with the sprayer and actually work and knead the foam the um the bubble hash that's in the bag and you can work a foam on it and you can actually work the foam up to the edge and then blast the foam straight through the side of your thing knocking off all those the, the trichome stalks and all the the extra junk plant material and it works really good uh, frenchy demonstrated it to us in class and everything and um there's a little bit of a like a hand technique to just to working the foam in the in the bubble bags but when they're not submerged but it it, it works really really good and that's how he's getting that just platinum blonde hash that he makes you know you don't get that platinum blonde hat i mean i have some pictures i'm sure hash from norway 
Yeah, it's just <laughs> right there, ridiculous. <laughs> Not hash from those shithole trichomes. <laughs> hash from Norway. Okay. Uh, yeah, give, you an idea. Hash, that give you an idea. Look how blonde that is. I mean, that's like white. <laughs> That, that's the bu- that's the bubble we made that day. I mean, it's I've never yeah, seen stuff that blonde. Is that what you're saying? Wow. <laughs> well, I've seen it that blonde, but it came from from Middle East, you know. Lebanese um, blonde. Yeah, like yep. Yeah, I've seen that back in the day. She, Lebanese, Lebanese. It's probably yeah. okay to talk about it, but now, but in the '70s, guys in the Air Force would fly fly back with uh, just pounds of uh, of hash from Iran stored in a fuselage where they put their beer you know like yeah. in the, they uh, take the in, inner fuselage and un, unscrew it and then stash stuff in between the outer and the inner shell on the plane and bring it back back yeah, in the i day. got the, i got the tie mm-hmm. stick back in the day and that was pretty me too i i got a good tie stick story I, my friend I, my roommate we we were he was we were music you know he's a musician he was a music teacher and um, we, he were, I met him. He was working at one of the local music stores, and we. Uh, it was one of the first places I lived when I moved out from my parents. When I was about nineteen, and I was working at Seven Eleven on the graveyard shift from eleven to seven. And he had some friends come in from California with some freaking tie stick, and I'd never had it before, you know. And you know, so I come down from my shower, getting ready to go. See, they said, "Here, check this out." So I took like two or three tokes. And I'm going. Okay, I don't think, see nothing special about this. And then I got out of the apartment and I rode down around the corner and I got about a half a mile to the stoplight. Next thing I know, I realized I was sat through two green lights at the corner, you know, um, just watching the freaking light change, you know. And uh, that was an interesting night at work, to say the least. But yeah, the, the Tommy, that real deal tie stick back in the day in the 70s. Woo! Yeah, that, that, that was something. That was something experience so i got lucky that way and i i had actually lived in turkey when i was young so i've seen poppy fields too oh cool but we didn't mess with it i mean you know i'm military brat we just rode by it down the road from the from town to the base but you know i haven't seen a, a yep. poppy field but i have seen a coca field <laughs> when i was in peru yeah now, i haven't been down there yeah, I just, you know, you got to the point with that in the 70s and 80s where it probably just really wasn't a real good idea to go down there and look at coca fields, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, that's the reason like, we don't have like cannabis wasn't already legal, legal by Jimmy Carter, Carter was the damn cocaine. Yeah, like You know, if it wasn't for cocaine, Jimmy Carter would have legalized cannabis in the 70s, you know, or eight, whatever it was. Yeah, but then how, how would Ronald Reagan have paid for his, uh, his Iran-Contra? Yeah, well, that, just think about the way the history would have been changed had had the, the cocaine. Well, the cocaine happened, so there's really no speculating that it wasn't going to happen. But that's a lot of people don't realize that cannabis would have been legalized back then, most likely, and then the war on drugs with the cocaine, you know, Panama and all that stuff well, was money, going on, and they had to slam down their head, slam everything. Band. And 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 the repugs have used the contraband side, money what? side of it to move a lot of stuff. That's where I see the biggest impediment yeah. to all the legalization is that's been a cash cow for them. And like I always say, Marlboro doesn't own a patent to it. I mean, they're already selling their packs of cigarettes out there for like 80 bucks or whatever they're selling them for. You know, Have you seen them? All y'all seen those? I'm, I'm, I haven't seen them. Yeah, they got out. There's like... Um, I believe it's two or three states, Washington, the whole West Coast, at least Washington. But Marlboro has a pack of cannabis cigarettes that it's like a green pack with a marijuana leaf on the front of it. it says Marlboro. They actually they've been selling it for a while, and it's like eighty eighty dollars a pack. So like I bet average to about four or five dollars a. Really, uh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. I saw somebody made. I know a guy who was producing in in Marlboro packs. And Marlboro shut his ass down so fast it made his head spin. <laughs> yeah. I remember those. those well, you, can San Diego. It. you can probably Google it and you'll find a picture of the pack. You know, it's what, a what legitimate Marlboro package. What was it? What was the Marlboro? Uh, do you have the one? Guy, you had one at the house. Stay down here in uh, San Diego. 
was putting out those little 10 pack Marlboro packs. It was like half the size of a Marlboro pack, but it had, it looked like a fucking Marlboro pack. And he, he'd only put out like, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand dollars worth of them. And woo, he got burned. Oh yeah. They, they don't play. They don't play. Oh, it's like, how how on God's earth did they even find you? You haven't done anything yet. And it was just bam. Well, it gets found because social media, yeah. people post that yeah. picture, they find that pack, and then they post it all over freaking Yahoo and Facebook and everywhere. So it wasn't so I don't think really it, was, huh? it wasn't called Marlboro. Yeah. It was called like yeah, so, I don't do that shit. Yeah. Yeah, but there's oh, actually one that yeah, I, I have to find that picture. Because there's actually there's actually a Marlboro package that says Marlboro on it, and it's got the exact same uh, it's the exact same look as any other other. In other words, it's a different green from the menthol. It's a different color green from the menthol cigarettes, but it looks like a pack of menthol Marlboros, but it's got a pot leaf on front of it. Now it might be a lie, just like Jake's stuff was. Well, it might it might be, but the article was about how they were selling it out west in different states. It wasn't, you know. Uh, you know I, there was, I'm not seeing I, 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 I know there was a few might be right. last might be, year. Might be fake. It might be Trump news, fake news, you know, or something like that. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it. I know there was like towards the end of last year, somebody made a fake post with a, a thing on it, and it got circled around i haven't seen it in a while but um I haven't, I haven't heard of anything have you seen anything in california i haven't seen anything in the dispensaries here uh just the ones that uh tommy talked about well, let's see i'm gonna google it real quick and see if i can come up with anything on it so we were talking about um ripeness so the think of the the trichome heads as a um like a water tank or a balloon and you want them to reach like a minimum size before they're or like an apple right you want it to get the right color and the right size before you're ready to harvest it so your ripe trichome heads are generally between 73 micron and 160 micron less than that you can um so you're 25 and 45 micron you do get some like uh, some of that but you will actually get a lot more cbg and you'll get a lot more uh, cbd in those lower ones than you will in the other ones some of the stuff that Frenchie went over, it was really cool to learn about. And um, uh, yeah, so I thought that was really interesting. So he, he pulls mostly the, um, the the 73 through 160, and then the sometimes he'll, he'll do a full one. It's like a 45 through 160, but I thought that was really interesting. So larger than that, you can still have full gland heads that are larger, but you end up with higher chance of, of just debris and, and other junk. Um, so, yeah, this says that there's four states that have Marlboro marijuana cigarettes for sale. And here's a pic, here's a link to the YouTube video on it right here. Huh. That's interesting. I have never seen that. Now it's rolling right here. It says uh, Washington. I knew Washington was one of them. It's, they're all out west. I think it's Washington, I Oregon. I don't think they're legit. You know, I don't think they're legit though. Because I've never, I haven't heard of any of the Philip Morris or anyone getting into the weed industry. In fact, they've kind of avoided it. RJ Reynolds. What? I, I got an idea. How about we start a new industry? We we muscle in on the Swanson's TV dinners and stuff that we all grew up on, and we just make a, like a microwavable dinner that is portioned with your cannabis. And it comes with the. Oh, drink. I'm sorry. It's Philip Morris. Philip Morris is Marlboro. Yes, I'm aware of that. That's why I was saying I wasn't aware that Philip Morris was in the weed game. I, I was under the impression that they were not in the weed game yet. I don't know of any well, license. See, all right, well, so what, it'd be interesting, but this looks pretty convincing. There's a lot of stories yeah. about it. If, and if, it's if from, Philip yeah. Morris was in it, Jeff Sessions would not be saying what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> Philip Morris was in it, Jeff Sessions would not be saying what he's saying. If Philip Morris was in it, you'd see it at the casinos in Vegas. Huh. Yeah, you know, the, the gaming board at that point, the gaming board would probably feel comfortable to, to let it go. You know, right now, the gaming board is not about to screw up their profits. So, 
Well, the thing is, is they haven't been able to patent and control it. And so I, I think that's part of why, you know, again, now we're going to now we've got this question whether it's a true story or, or not. But I was under the belief that they did. They were actually in it. It's just that they can't control it. So it's limited to those Western states where there's legalization in, pro, in place. But, you know, I guess we'll find out by next week. Somebody will come on and prove me wrong or, or whatever. Or I'll figure it out this week one other way or the other. Because now I'm going to be curious because I thought it was true. So No, it's not. It's not true. Yeah, so I, I agree with R. He says uh, in chat, he says, kind of enjoy my 7390 and 120 separate. Um, I, I kind of like to have all my stuff separate. They can be nice in blends, um, especially those middle blends because they tend to have uh, a little bit. I don't know if you guys have made a lot of separate bubble, basically separate all your bubble hash and then press it um, either Together. whatever your method is. But uh, when you press it, um, uh, I noticed that the so the 25 and the 45 uh, end up with really more like play-doh it's very malleable and you can work the material real easy uh, whereas uh, the 73 kind of starts to get a little more like glass and then the 90 and the 120 and the 160 are really glass like uh, it'll splinter and shatter just like it's a, pe a piece of glass um, you know, it's really interesting to see that and you can you know you can tell the size of the you know, if you're getting those full gland heads or not, by kind of how it melts and how it behaves afterwards. Well, you only use the one bag for when you're doing your pressing for your rosin, right? So what is, what micron was that again? What size tell everybody that you use for before you press? You do your bubble hash, just one size bag, right? And then you press no, it. No. So, uh, well, yeah. So they'll yeah. Do, we'll do 25, 45, 73, 90, 120, 160, um, and sometimes 190, depending on what the material is. The bigger the number, the, the, the smaller the hole? No. The smaller the number, the smaller the hole. The, the, the micron size is the size that. of the hole, not the... So it's the diameter of the uh, the the thing that can go through. Well, on, on a sandpaper micron type thing, like they use on bowling ball, polished bowling balls, 400 micron is smaller particles than 320. Or um, 220 so it's, or it's, 160. It's the... It's the um, how many microns across the hole is? Oh, okay, oh, okay. So All it's right. so it's the same in the uh in the bags. So like six hundred grit grit sandpaper is much finer than one hundred grit, and so it's right. the same in the bag number. So a twenty five would be gravel. Where no, twenty five would be fine, super fine, and then the one the two twenty is your catch the plant material. 90 is really backwards. small, right? So it's just back. That's wild. Well, that's yeah. the exact opposite of how it's used for when it's used as an abrasive. So that's that's nice and right. confusing when you get when you yeah. both call microns, you know. Leave it to the stuff. Good to know, though. Things it's up. smaller than the number. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's easy enough. To, yeah. As long as you compare it to sandpaper, you just say flip it like great. Right. Yeah. So the so if I'm going to, oh shit, what do I do here? I'll turn my volume down. There we go. So if you, um, if you're going to press your, your stuff in a rosin press, you're going to do flour. You want to generally use like a 73 micron or a 90 micron. Works really good. Okay. That's what and I And then uh, if you're going to press your stuff, if you're going to press bubble hash, you you know, use like a 36 <laughs> micron or a 45 micron, something a little finer. It'll, it'll come out better. But make sure you double bag it. So uh, I always will double bag mine with 36s. Uh, I'll put them in, the put the hash in the bag. And then um, you have your... Um, uh, bag goes across and you have the seam on one side so i'll pack that up and then i'll make it maybe about this this much maybe you know about half the the width of my thumbnail um uh, depth of, of hash and then i'll spread that nice and thin and then i'll fold the end and then i'll stuff it in another bag the opposite way so that the seams are opposite of each other and the bottom is folded over at the sealed end of the bag this way when i press it slow especially with the with the bubble and stuff if you don't do that slow enough your bag will blow out every time like you'll just blow your bags. Uh, same thing you need to, when you do bubble, you need to slow down your rosin press time and make it slower and a little bit longer. Um, and because uh, if you do, again, do it fast, it's going to smash and blow out right out the side and you are got to repack the whole thing. It's kind of a pain in the ass. <laughs> so, whereas the flour you can do real quickly, um, but the bubble you want to do slow and ramp your pressure. You know, we start off at 100 PSI and go up to 
you know, five or 8,000 or something like that over the course of, you know, three, three and a half minutes. You lower the temperature too? Yeah. So I'll do like 180 Fahrenheit, 175 okay. Fahrenheit instead that of the, you know, 200 or 210 usually for flour. You know, I'll do flour a little bit warmer, a little bit hotter because it tends to flow better. Uh, it depends on the girl. Well, yeah, that the a to everything, where I imagine it, and, and when you start concentrating all that stuff, they're just thinking like extraction wise. Mm -hmm. We want to ramp that up and then let it ooze uh, and and yeah, having a little bit lower temperature uh, and a little bit more time, yeah, we definitely uh, facilitate that. I'm looking forward to getting started on that. I haven't I haven't done that stuff, but it sounds pretty fascinating. Yep. Got to get a press. Yeah, man, you do. You got to get you one. one. I'm going to get one. <laughs> I'm thinking it's going to be really cool to use for for breeding to be able to uh, press each plant and see you know the low temperatures and where you can almost see the i guess the mix of the amount of wax and lipids and terpenes and all this kinds of stuff you know right i mean the pr pressing is really yes kind of showing exactly like you get to like week four pull a bud off there squeeze the shit out of it taste it find out where it is look at it know it take it to the next week's take another bud you know just squeeze it and you'll start associating the dry food. it's got to be kind of dry you're seeing yeah but i've heard of people people do something with fresh um with fresh bud what is that steve um they there's some way that they uh, is it the way of there's a way of making bubble hash with it or hash with it when it's What's fresh that? when it's fresh frozen oh yeah yeah fresh so, frozen. A ways. so you can do flat ideally you want to flash freeze it um but if you can't flash, flash freeze free, it, frozen yeah, so ideally right. you want to freeze it. And the reason why you want to freeze it is you want to keep it from being sticky. When it's cold, it's not sticky. Um, and then you you get it super cold. And then you want to put it in as cold water. If you can get it in 34 or 36 degree water, that's perfect. Um, you don't have to have ice as long as the water is very cold. And you can keep it from getting super hot. So if you can you know, wrap it or um, put a little chiller in there or whatever you're going to do. Or ice, you know, it's the cheapest. Um, and then you want to run it for about five minutes. Uh, and then, you know, take your water off, do your thing, fill it back up, do it again. Um, so that's more or less what we did. It, <laughs> the class. Live live oh, rosin or something? Oh, oh no, I'm it? sorry. I'm sorry. That was just the oh. bubble. But So if live rosin oh, yeah. is you can take plants right the day of harvest and immediately take them and, and run the bubble. You know, immediately bubble hash them. Uh, freeze you don't have to do that. Didn't you say you preferred it? No, you like it was trimming, I think. But you've well, no, done that. I've done that too. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think it was Brain Grow or maybe it was JR Token that kind of turned me on to doing that live bubble hash. I just did something I never tried to do. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It was just something I never did. So, must be terpy as, as an animal. Somebody asked me if I cut my dreads. No. I didn't. Cut I would like that. See, I'd like it like that too, because that means that the the, T, the THC hasn't deteriorated as much as the trichomes either. So it'd be fresher, more um, um, viable THC. It it'd, it'd be it'd be it'd be as terpy as as a monster. Now the other thing you could do too is uh, what I find works a little bit better is running it um, like R said in chat. You know, running a three to five day cure. And then doing it, it'll dry up the plants a little bit better. The trichome stalks tend to dehydrate enough to where those heads want to pop right off. So if you're doing bubble hash, you know, you are going to lose some of the trichome, a little bit of the terpenes. You know, some of there's a handful of those super fresh ones, but you'll still get something that tastes pretty freaking similar. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Tommy and I are ultra excited to use uh, some of our uh, some of our stuff we have in the in the R and D. Uh, uh -huh. uh, stuff with some of this uh doing some live res stuff with it uh because the, the stuff we've gotten even from from cured material is is astronomically good and to, to taste it from uh you know fresh stuff is going to be even more insane so i definitely look forward to that but so Jeanette, like, traditionally Jeanette definitely count a lot yep so traditionally live resin though uh is when they take the plants dip them in liquid nitrogen flash freeze them 
uh, and then do their their separation, uh, usually BHO or CO2 after that. It just preserves everything a little bit better. Mm. But much fuller um, uh, terpene. Yep, also helps prevent it from buttering up too from moisture. So keeps it more stable, as R said in chat. Also, thank you, R, for joining. I don't think we've seen you before. So. Yeah, it also lets oh. you uh, deal with, like, depending on the temperature your material's at, uh, it lets you have a different palette of uh, polar solvents that you can go in and, and draw stuff out with, too. So, yeah, temperature's a, a really important thing in how, how you preserve what you're after, basically, like, in a custody chain. Until you, you get some of this stuff out of the plant. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. So, well, on that dead note, I want to give a shout out to my father who turned 85 today. Awesome. Congratulations. Right. And my you. mother and father are together. She'll be 81 next month. And they've been together and married for years. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I've just thought of that and I'm real excited that. I'm, I'm still have my daddy. He's 85 today. Right on. Happy birthday, man! Congrats, happy birthday! 85 years young. <laughs> yep, I, he's still doing, still doing real well. I mean, he's had his heart, his heart operations and stuff, but modern science is amazing, and uh, he's his, his eyes aren't so good. So he only he, what he loves best is playing golf, and he doesn't get to play golf as much. He doesn't enjoy it because. Even if he hits a good shot, he can't see the ball when in flight. So I guess that, you know, being that I've got macular degeneration myself and I've got the same, yeah, it kind of takes the fun out of playing golf because you're the blind leading the blind. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, yeah, well, see, we got that. You ought to see us. We go shopping tomorrow, every Friday at noon. He, he comes out and picks me up and then we go in the, into Walmart and I do my shopping and, uh, yeah, it's the blind leading the blind. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. That, that's what gar animals are for. Awesome. Animals. <laughs> you just match the animals up and your outfit always looks good. Yeah. There you go. I had a anyway, well, thanks for that. Thanks for that little segue there. I just wanted to shout out for dad. Yeah. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Dad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being a great That's dad. Good stuff right there. That's the good yeah. stuff. So uh what um what do you got going on, Marty? And your do you got any grow going on or anything at the moment? Um, I've, I've been building so many servers and shit that I haven't, I have 10 plants waiting for me in the garage that are probably like, I'm going to have to cut the grow bags off of them because they're probably root bound. And, uh, so I need to get them transplanted and I'm going to move, I'm going to hook up the, um, ceramic metal halide lights. Uh, so I have to get those hooked up so I can use those. and. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to do that. Uh, I'll have uh, the house to myself for like a day and a half this weekend. So I'm hoping to be able to get some shit done then. And that next week we can do a little, little tour of the new setup. Cool. Are you, are you all moved now or? Nope, not moving. <laughs> oh, you're not moving now? I haven't been moving for a while. Oh. I missed that. Already though. That's all right. It changed so often. Would your neighbor move? Nope. <laughs> no, he had an accident hey, though. I, no, Marty, <laughs> Marty, I know this guy. Just say <laughs> I know this guy. He might be able to help you with a problem. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Not, not sure Dorian can help, but maybe. <laughs> um, we'll see. <laughs> Dorian would unleash a logic bomb on the man. Yeah. It, which is far worse than anything else you could do with explosives. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about you, uh, Mr. Green Jeans? What have you been doing in your grow? Yeah, just uh, trying to hold off the plants with a machete, man. I mean, they grow too, too damn fast for me. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, those, those 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 the G13s are finishing up. I picked a few of them. It's genetics, it's kind of uh, kind of interesting. They they're 
they're they're beautiful um they're all females there were supposed to be straight seeds what are the odds i mean come on they, they it can't be right they had to be feminized there must be something going on whatever how many there's a glitch in the matrix at 11 from the 10 seeds the two were twins oh oh hey you were talking about that earlier yeah that doesn't yeah, seem twin. it's pretty cool yeah. and but they're they're not that they're not that unusual other than uh that they, they were twins but they're both females so that makes 11 out of 10 seeds and uh, i still never got remember i was talking i was dreaming about the idea of getting a male and female and that twin was uh, you know, and over the, the number of years that I've been growing, that was at least the 11th or 12th that I've seen and successfully separated. And I've never gotten a male and female pair of seeds. Mostly they're males. Most twins are males, uh, but some are females. These ones were females. And the D Dutch genetics are kind of interesting. They're, the, the plants are big. They're, um, they're very, they're vigorous. They, they have beautiful big buds, uh, but the, the smells, and this is my impression from before, the smells are a little bit on the muted side. Uh, the terpenes are not, you know, not blaring in any way. There's not much uh, character there. There is a little bit to one or two of the plants there, but they're very, the, the entire terpene profile is, I would say, pretty mild. Although some of them look, nice you know they look very resiny they're obviously and i i test i've you know, dried and smoked a couple of them they're, they're they're reasonable they i would say they're probably not as potent whatever that means you know what i mean <laughs> whatever that means as they look you know they sort of look the one a couple that i've tried now probably look more resiny and more frosty and impressive than they actually smoke um and you know, I've I've often wondered, you know, maybe the because the people in maybe the Dutch, you know, they 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 so they I don't know whether they test uh, with with tobacco, but I know they they often roll stuff with tobacco, and so I wonder if they are you know really flavor you know getting a flavor you know understanding the flavors because they they seem to be not focusing on that as a trait. You can kind of tell what the breeder what the previous breeders we're thinking about you know when you look at when you grow out someone's seeds because marijuana you know varies in so many ways and most of its traits are very you know variable traits are not often on you know sort of easily uh sortable into punnett squares they're not you know obviously dominant and recessive they're often variably expressed so you can generally tell what the other breeders were thinking about and it seems like they didn't don't think much about uh the smells and tastes there which I, I think is unusual i mean that's to me prime nation you know what i mean um uh, you know i i love plants that smell and taste unusual and different and yeah you know, and that's right usually a sign that the ter terpene profile is something unique and generally they also plants like that also have an interesting effects psychoactive effects are generally get you high in an unusual way you know a nice strong kind of Tur terpenes are the thing terpenes are, the thing terpenes are good man you love them i love them <laughs> i love them we love them here in california in the united states i think that's those guys they 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 smoke they always rolling with tobacco man you shouldn't be smoking tobacco it's not good for you folks and i don't think it's good if you're breeding if you know because I swear that, you know, the, 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 what smells that I do detect, they're, they're, uh, they're kind of all over the place. And they're not, you know, some of them are kind of unpleasant, like you get a little bit of soap in there. What's that soapy smell or some perfume or something like that? Yeah, yeah the soap is the one stuff. that gives me quidge. What? The soap, the soap is... tastes are the ones that give my body quidge, you know, like, like chalk on the Maybe, maybe you let it cure a while. It'll it'll smell like cheese or something. I don't know. Well, but you, you'll get that. Some people love them. You'll get that one from um, Europeans. people that use a ton of yucca. The the sapenin. The plants readily uptake the sapenin from the yucca. And 
Sapin and uh, you can make soap from sapin and from yucca. So it's the same compound. But this is a smell to the to the flower. It's genetic, genetic, genetic thing. You know, they're all they're all different. You know, they're they're but they're very mild. They're very slight. It's a very slight thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's as if they they didn't think of those they were not thinking of those traits but the one the traits that they were looking at are really impressive I'll tell you what <clears throat> the buds look beautiful most of them not all of them there's a bit of variation but most of them are really nice and healthy big ass looking fantastic yield very resiny looking you know maybe they would taste great mixed with tobacco and a spliff too I don't know. Maybe I just don't know how to smoke this stuff, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I've smoked tobacco and it's never tasted but, good uh, any of the times I smoked it. So <laughs> it doesn't get you high. So, so I was like, oh, whoa, what are you giving me? It tastes like shit and it doesn't get you high. So like yeah. Hey, but at least wow. at least it's addictive. Okay. At least it's addictive. <laughs> well, as we all as we all know, cannabis is addictive when you grow it. Growing is addictive. Yeah. Crazy. Right, yeah. Right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's face it. Growing is addictive. Yeah. My first indoor I built to get me through the winter, so. You don't have to grow nothing and you can still get addicted to tobacco. I know <laughs> I am. <laughs> I need I need my vitamin N. <laughs> vitamin N. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, weed is vitamin M, and then nicotine vitamin is M. vitamin M. Vitamin M. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of an ass. I'll shut up now. I know. <laughs> we love you anyway. It's fine. Oh man, I'm happy. This allegedly, this bud I've got, this blue dream bud I'm putting in this paper right now, allegedly. Wow. It's just now finally dry to actually roll a joint for the first time in a month. You have such so, a wonderful imagination, Roger. I, I really appreciate that about you. Oh, shoot. I'll tell you what. I'm so happy. I'll tell you what. This Blue Dream, Modi, I'm tell you what, bud. This shit, it's, it's surprising. I've never had anything to surprise me. Every once in a while, I get a bud. Like I, I, when it first got dry a couple of days ago, you know, you get that when it's first really good, crackling dry. It just tastes so freaking good in a pipe. And I smoked a bowl, and I was sitting here in a fog. You know, and when you can put one of anybody on this panel, and you can smoke something and get foggy, you know, like that's some good shit. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Well, stuff. And that blue dream, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Stuff that's ready when it's just dry, too. There's a lot of recently, you know, you can get the right. And actually, Blue Dream is one of those kinds of things. I have I had a cut of that that was really good immediately as soon as it was as it was dry. No curing. You know, the, the leaves are really fine and small and the stems are teeny and you know, there's no chlorophyll in it anyways, you know, and it's just top quality right at, immediately as soon as it's dry there's no and you don't cure I, something no, like that. no problem keeping the scent and the taste you know and all that either it's like you open a bit just this beautiful sweet floral smell you know it's, mm -hmm. it's nice yeah there's a quite a bit of uh stuff nowadays the right genetics that that you can you know consume immediately you don't really need to i think in my opinion it i think it's related to chlorophyll so plants that and it also is the length of flowering time like if it's a short time of flowering it's really hard to get the chlorophyll it's hard to make the plant use up its chlorophyll and its leaves and if it's a indica yeah. plant with big fat a lot of nitrogen then it's not going to use up the chlorophyll and it's going to flower physics, really quick physics, and it's still going to have pretty green leaves well, so you're gonna have to see this this blue dream it's clone it's a clone now i mean i still got seeds but these these have turned out with with the more of a sativa pheno as far as the, yeah. the leaves went we got the long skinny fingered leaves on this yeah for ones and, and even know, an I, again, I don't know what it's what do you know what is bread what what makes a blue dream do you know what they put together to make that no i don't 
No, I don't. Okay. I, I think it's California. I, you know, I've, I've looked at uh, two or three different cuts of what were called Blue Dream. Again, what's in a name? But not really. There is, I mean, there, there is a type I, I would, and I think we would all agree. Uh, it's definitely a sativa type, and it looks uh, bluish or light grayish when it's uh, flowering. And, uh, you know, the, the, the reflection of the, the trichomes is, is you know, bluish kind of as a light. In fact, the plant was the worst looking. You've got a nice CMH yeah. light in there, and you can see the right colors. Yep. Sorry. It, they, it was the worst looking plant of all the plants that I had. Yeah. You know, it, it like straight, it looked kind of leggy and you know stringy looking, but the buds, I mean, they were just sticky as a son of a bitch and they stink. And it should be kind anybody of, that, of course, should be nice uh, tree, uh, mountain shape, a nice uh, triangle. Well, my, you know, my from a clone, you can't necessarily. I mean, you could prune it that way, but you know. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm saying the mount, the the shape of the bud, the shape of each uh, each oh. flower, is kind of um, kind of pointed at the top, maybe like a. I, I kind of got that with the blueberry this time. I got that kind yeah. of that kind of pointed look, look like a little miniature Christmas tree they did have on them, you know, on the table at Christmas with a little winter scene or something like that. Yeah, Blue Dream. That's one of our. I think it's one of our good. Cal, I don't know. I'd love to know who who, who did the work on that. I think it's uh, partly DJ a Shorts Blueberry. Blue it's Dream. Got to be Colorado. Blue Dream is a Colorado strain. Colorado strain. Oh, yeah. man, I thought it was California. Yeah, and we can all assume it's blueberry, you know. But that's that that's not a sativa, so it's interesting, you know. No, it's an indica. Yeah. No, I, that's what I, I could I, be wrong on this, but I was pretty sure that Blue Dream and Golden Goat both were Colorado developed. Someone could probably correct me. Maybe I don't know. Wrong here. Anyways, the the I know Blue Dream is kind of a good bread and butter strain. A lot of the dispensaries grow because it's relatively pest resistant. You can't really Easy to grow. fuck it up. It grows really well. It harvests yep. well. It yields well. The buds are big. It's not annoying like cookies are to trim. Um, you know, it's just low labor. The master race, is, everyone <laughs> loves it. And people love to grow it. People love to consume it. Everyone loves it. Consumers love it. So I actually have a, a blue, uh, we call it blue hash. It's a blue dream hash plant. It's like a blue dream crossed with Af some kind of Afghan. And man, that that's the strongest strain that I have. I mean, uh, of all, I mean, that one's seriously like a good two to three days ahead of all the other seeds I've started already. And it's because I can get Afghan. I can get we got Afghan too. Well, especially especially being a colder climate, the Afghan will do real well. They're a little more adapted to the cold. That's what's cool. That snowstorm and all we had, you know, we had that three weeks of super, super cold weather that's unusual here, and uh the seven inches of snow, and that was as everything was finishing. So it was kind of nice. I didn't have to fight temps or anything like that during the finish. I got that nice, naturally colder environment going on and less humidity, and it really made a nut for a nice finish on everything. Talking to Pineapple Hayes yesterday, allegedly. <laughs> Actually, yeah, so uh, Frenchie was saying that uh, the ideal temperature was uh, 55 degrees at 35% humidity for curing plants. So I like that. Well, thirty. He likes thirty-five percent. Well, I think it depends on where you live too. If you live in a real tropical climate, it's going to be different than a desert climate. Oh yeah, I mean, good luck at thirty-five percent in Jamaica. Yeah, at no point are you ever going yeah, to do it. That's that. right. <laughs> Maybe in a it's freezer. Like, that's like here. Here it's ninety to one hundred percent sometimes in the summer. You know, you know, good luck. It's been raining for a week. Good luck keeping your humidity down to forty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be like trying to get it here in Portland and be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get thirty-five yeah. percent of humidity. Yeah. Well, I got a dehumidifier that has a drain hooked up to a drain. Well, you know, to a drain, so you know, and it, it'll suck out. It'll fill up a five-gallon bucket in a couple of days. You know, easy. You know, just an eight-by-eight eight room. That was kind of kind of interesting when I used to do that. Um, right now, I'm running a portable AC that does de uh, dehumidifying as well as a air conditioning. So, I got my dehumidifier stashed. But yeah, I used to. I used to have it sit on a set it on a, a stool, and then I put a five-gallon bucket, pinch PVC hose, 
binoculars and crammed it up there and it, it would fill up the damn pipe. I didn't go in there the second day and pay attention when the lights came on. I went in there to a wet floor. The second day, you go in there and empty that five gallon bucket of that, um, you know. So, yeah, it's pretty humid here. So, ranting on. Yep. I, yeah, it must be good blue dream. Blah, 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 blah. You know? <laughs> Everyone loves blue dream. It's great. I tell you, it'll knock your ass out and put you to sleep, too. And this was not, um, and I didn't take it. It wasn't real super mature and ripe, you know. I feel like I had to take this a little early, too, because of some personal shit that's going on. And uh, But I, I knew it was still ready. But just, you know, to, I kind of like the more up high stuff. But this, I tell you what, I, the other the same time, when the, I did the other night, I, I, I smoked some of it. The next thing I know, I woke up on the couch, you know, like two hours later so if you want blue dream i will say this the dream is right if you smoke enough of it you will go to sleep yeah, so, the, you can't od on blue dream you'll pass out first you know it's kind of quant <laughs> it's kind of one of those quantity related strains i think these um it's a modern hybrid strain i mean we kind of think of it as being sativa dominant uh i think but a lot of them that are, you know, just very potent. There's a lot of THC. Uh, they're they're uplifting and they're, you know, in smaller doses, in smaller amounts. And then you you you, right. you ingest more and you go to sleep. But exactly. it, I think so too. Know, and, and I see that in hybrids getting to a working more through, modern you know, hybrid, broad effect. Back all these years, I see that that I got. I gotta tell you, most of the hybrids, even the ones you think might be uh, indica dominant, it ends up always ends up with the sativa style leaves by the end of the. It'll start out looking fat, and then it'll transfer. The, the leaves will shrink, you know, into thinner leaves by the end of the grow. And you I know, think the, drug, the, key drug get, crazy. the key to getting the the right the sativa effects out of plants like that is just smoke less. You know what I mean? And everybody's like, oh, my God, my tolerance is so high. Holy shit, you know. And, yeah, it's true. But, I mean, <clears throat> kind of not not every morning, you, you, you know, you're, no matter how many dabs you did the day before, you're, you're pretty good in the morning. And if you do little little hits of one of those, you know, nice sativas, you'll, you'll get that effect. And even if it's one of those hybrids, it's got kind of a heavy indica pow behind it a little bit. As long as you keep the the dose down, you'll you'll still feel a lot of that sativa thing. You know what yeah, I mean? So sense. that's why I'm saying it's dose dependent in a way. You know? <laughs> well, I always find that so sativa is the one. The, if you smoke too much sativa, like if you start to feel the effects and you don't stop smoking it, that you know you can create a little bit of anxiety for yourself by smoking too much. You know? Absolutely. Sativa. Absolutely. Yeah, a so very sativa. stimulating sativa. This Oreo right here. This is giving people some panic attacks, man, because it you know you come yep. home late late at night and you're expecting to have a nice, you know, mellow kickback on the couch, and all of a sudden it's like you drank a cup of espresso and you're like, what the hell, you know, your mind is racing, and so I, I think that will give you a, a bad experience, you know. Nick, but Nick, not if you're not if you're edibles in with it, huh? Mix edibles in with it. <laughs> You know, I have a friend down here who has been making actually for a couple of years. He he works with a a medical consortium up here, and they make they make um ethanol, uh, you know, low temperature ethanol mm -hmm. extracts. And he loves it. the Oreo is one of his favorite plants. And he says that it's incredible for killing a migraine, but don't do it at not in the evening because it'll keep you up all night. Mm -hmm. He says if you eat drops, if you drink drops of that Oreo extract in the in, at night, you know, you'll you'll be up, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. You know, now they're finding out about the THCV we were talking about before, the, the was it te tetrahydrocannabivideol or something like that? Anabavarin. Vivarin, Vivarin. Anabavarin. Vivarin. Anabavarin. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Booyah. Thank you. I don't have to know nothing around here. Um, yeah, THCV, man. Um, weight loss, you know. Um, helping people with diabetes. Oh, my God. Holy moly. 
You don't talk about it, otherwise Taco Bell is going to outlaw it through lobbying. No, they're already. It's already the big. The big drug companies are already focusing on it. There's at least one already. They already know what it is. So I have a way. So if you there's a there's some tricks you can do with how you raise your plants, and we have a trick that we've on average bumped the plants twelve to eighteen percent in THCV. Uh, using some of the experiments we're working with right now. Once we have that tied down, uh, I could probably tell you a little bit more on that. But well, I uh, certainly want to know because you know it's uh, it's obviously a huge uh, genetic factor. I mean, we we noticed this years ago about the the plant. You know, people were um, coming. Uh, a friend of mine who was growing and selling was you know people were coming back and saying that uh, you know that it was an appetite suppressant. We heard this years ago. People were like, "Wow, when I eat that, you know, I don't." I just work. I just do a bunch of stuff, and I don't eat anything all day. And you know, it's that's turning out to be the science is already supporting that. We'd already we'd already uh, observed it about the plant before. Pretty interesting. I work Actually, with an, uh, I, I work with a uh, another molecule called Samantin mm-hmm. with some people that had a. Uh, they did testing for the FDA, yada yada yada, but. Uh, it was a molecule that would suppress your appetite. They originally tried to give it to cattle because it was very high in fats and other things like that. And I thought like, oh great, we're gonna fatten the cows up for market. Unfortunately, the cows lost weight. So yeah. I was involved with moving it into the weight loss industry because you know people don't give a fuck. They wanna lose 15 pounds. And uh, but fatten the any, cows. Any, any of those things it doesn't matter what it is your body will hit a stasis with it and will eat anyway as a plant defense if you think of it in those terms you've got herbivores moving through the terrain and they're going to start eating leaves off your plant so if they are in your area and they're eating and they don't feel hungry that's good for you and if after a little while whatever is eating on the plant doesn't feel like I'm getting nourished it just naturally moves on so uh, but yeah any any of these things like yes it's going to be a big buzz about the THCB but and and the weight loss industry is going to go crazy with it people are going to make you know hundreds of millions of dollars but it's just this, it, it's it comes at the end of the day, it's physics, you know. You just suggested, Tommy, that it's a genetic thing that the plant uses to protect itself. Mm-hmm. Because when the pest comes along and eats it, it says, hmm, I'm not so hungry anymore. So you eat less. Holy crap. And then you move on looking Thank for Thank you, food. Tommy. Thank you. That was marvelous. <laughs> that was very beautiful. You know, I wonder if anyone has taken these different compounds, different terpenes and different cannabinoids and sprayed insects with them or, or you know, it just I, I'd be so curious to see how the, yeah. com- the compounds do individually. Um, I know we're working with some stuff for mold resistance right now that um, is pretty cool. That's in the protein uh, enzyme range. But because cannabis has amazingly few pest well not really but amazingly few considering how non-poisonous it is how non-toxic it is and how apparently benign it is or at least how non-toxic it is it is to us mm-hmm. you know and, and the, the whole thing about plants are you know insects are adapted to only eating a few species you know it's that's one of the amazing things about spider mites you know is that they are they don't come from the insect family so they're adapted to eating a lot more things than a beetle or something like that but you know and the whole problem is that every insect has to evolve it's you know evolve uh, to be able to eat whatever and all plants create stuff that protect themselves and tell the insects to move on because they're toxic and it's too hard to eat only that plant so i've heard i know i've heard ed rosenthal on other podcasts talk about how the oils that the cannabis plant produces um are uh, somewhat 
not insecticidal, but pest repellent, you know? You know what? And that makes also, great sense. Because and also, uh, you know, if a plant gets, little, if a plant, I'm sorry, if an insect gets into the trichomes during the flowering, that it also will get it. stuck in there and die. So, yeah, it's the size of the insects. Insects are so small, and those are volatile oils. They're, they're, um, they're, uh, the terpenes are, uh, and actually they're a little bit, uh, rough on us too in the sense of they get uh we have to get them out through our livers right our liver has to to do it and so actually you know it's we have to be careful with all aromatic oils right you can od on any kind of aromatic oil which is essentially terpenes yes mm -hmm. but insects are very better. small That's insects are little guys right and so for them the dosage you know just one whiff is is it's like we we can deal you know and we're huge <laughs> it's a scale thing isn't it that's exactly what it is so so Never for us like the that. terpenes on the for us the terpenes on the cannabis plant are, are nothing in terms of a dose but for the insect they, they many of them are too much probably no, no remember that Remember I'm, gonna terpenes, I'm gonna challenge you. Ter terpenes are like a, a basically behave like a free hydrocarbon. In fact, you, you you've seen uh, what is it? Um, uh, Tommy, what's the one? There's a terpene they actually some people are using for extraction. Mm. They're using a uh, lemonine. Uh, lemonine. There's actually a handful of people using lemonine for extraction. Um, lemonine, uh, along with a lot of other ones, happens to be it's very similar to hydrocarbon. It'll actually break down some of your other terpenes when you use it as a solvent because it starts to denature those compounds the same way an alcohol would or the same way that that BHO yep. would on a chemical level. And then you end up with this broken uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and that's where you get your harshness and that that cough and that shittiness and everything. So that's the reason why we need to switch to better options like rosin or some of the other stuff that's going to come why rosin you. tastes so good yeah and another thing you know, challenge on, on that whole premise is that terpenes are ultimately valuable and, 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 and i can prove it to you point blank the thc molecule in a sativa plant and an indica plant is the exact same effing molecule it is you, you isolate it, it's the same thing. Why does a sativa hit you different than a full-blown indica? It's the terpene. So the if you think about like space-time and that gravity tells space how to curve, which then informs mass how to move, if, if you look at it in, in this realm, you have the exact same molecule that expresses so differently from a sativa to an indica in your body and the thing that makes the thc molecule express is the terpene groups that's that's the keys to the kingdom that's that's my assertion and i'm willing to defend it absolutely theoretically if your nose is trained well enough by smelling a type of cannabis you can tell what kind of effect it's going to have on you yes mm -hmm. 100 percent yep i'm not saying my nose is trained that well but theoretically you know <laughs> we're all in school here mary jane is the teacher dude that's you know to, to me that the, as a breeder the smells are everything everything i mean because because if you think about it like whenever you take a whiff of cannabis it smells differently because uh it is affecting different parts of your nasal passageway and you can actually feel that if you pay attention to it totally totally yeah like uh some strains you know if they they got like maybe a minty minty uh flavored they uh you can smell that all the way to the back of your throat you know yes yeah it's irritating the piney the um the well, on, on uh, strong indicas that are yeah exactly make exactly make you sleep it's very like a turpentine like pine and actually that resin often is very sticky too when you touch the buds it's a little sticky it'll glue your fingers together it's not yeah. oily it's like yeah it's the like plant that I have that's uh, just getting ready for flowering I uh, picked a couple of buds prematurely 
and dried them out for a few days and pressed them in the rosin press and it felt like extremely extremely minty it was awesome like it was like the most refreshing but lemony taste it was awesome loved it and you wow. could taste that all the I way to the back pressed. of the throat like i'm saying um I yo get... yo rosin presses are awesome i've actually uh I'm getting one now tomorrow I've been uh, working on something that's pretty interesting, Most and uh, I'll talk about it next week. I have to uh, duplicate the project that I or the experiment that I just did in the past forty-eight hours because it was interesting to say the least. But um, I'll talk about more of that on the next episode when I do it again. <laughs> cool, rosin press, and it was so with the cool. rosin press. Yeah, it's so cool. It's you know solventless, basically solventless extract system. Yeah, basically using the uh, own internal vapors of the plant to distill the oils, yep. you know. And you know what's you know what's really cool about it is that it's emerging as a very skill oriented uh, uh, kind of a thing, which is kind of how bubble bubble hash has been for some time. Bubble hash is I don't know, correct me, kids, if I'm wrong, but it's at least twenty years old as a technique. And it's been around for some time. And some people have gotten really, really good at it, and I believe can, you know, make a living um, doing other people's processing. You know, because it's a skill. Because there's so much skill to making to doing bubble hash. But I'm I'm thinking that rosin uh, is is similar. Is going to be hot on already is hot on the heels of bubble hash in the sense of being a very skill oriented kind of thing, which is really cool because that's what branding is about. And everyone in cannabis is struggling with branding right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody's See, like, well, in my opinion, why, the that's thing why about edibles. cannabis is it's not so much skill oriented, but more based on the user's preference. Cause I was actually having a conversation on uh, ILGM today Even with a couple of other uh, folks that use the rosin press and I've been using it uh, at 115 Celsius. And um, I can't remember if it was Country Boy or uh, somebody else that was like, hey, uh, we're going uh, with a lower temperature for Much Keith cooler. at 130. I was like, what the heck? Uh, 130 is low for y'all, huh? I'm going flower at 115. You know, what's that about? But uh, I'm getting really, I'm super happy with my returns, you know, very flavorful and stable uh, returns, you know. You're doing 100 low and degrees well, Fahrenheit? I, yeah, I mean, one, 115 like, Celsius. Oh, Celsius. Yeah, that's hot. Celsius. Yeah, 115 Celsius. Hot. Dude, that's hella hot. I do. I would it's never do it more than 103 hot. Uh, 103 Celsius. It's just like. Oh well, see that the thing 20. about um with this, I kind of try and make up I'm for sure. the uh that little gap I was talking about with the plates, um, because there's a tiny little gap in there, um, between the actual plate that makes contact with your material and the plate that heats up and i was talking about that maybe a couple of weeks ago i'm not sure but um i've been pretty happy with the results but um i kind of bumped the temperature up a couple degrees just to make up for that you know uh, loss of temperature i guess you know but um it's it's definitely doing some pretty good presses and like i said these other guys were talking about pressing like at between 130 150 which, uh, in my opinion, yeah, that's super high. Like, anytime I've gone higher than, like, 120, that it's, like, sizzling and almost just spraying out the side. <laughs> my my, my uh, mindset, my philosophy is you spent a damn long time growing it. Take a few minutes and extract it right. <laughs> yeah. Just oh, like yeah. Jesus. This is not the time to rush this thing. Put the temperatures down a little bit. <laughs> exactly. You are worth it. You grew a badass girl. <laughs> you cured her. Slow the fuck down. Turn the temperatures down. Well, pre <laughs> pressing is like that. I think pressing is very, it's naturally very slow and uh, mellow kind of procedure. Isn't that yeah. 
Yeah, and the thing about rosin pressing, I know while I was in chat, I was hearing Steve talk about how uh, whenever you press down on your material hard before them, before, like, uh, if you feel it, um, you can feel whenever the lever is ready to go further down because it'll just give little by little, and then finally you'll get to that point where it clamps down. For my rosin press, personally, it's not one of those nice, fancy $6,000 ones that Steve has. But uh, you can definitely still feel it, and if you definitely go too fast, you'll you'll bust that parchment paper. Or if you're using one of those uh, screens, you'll uh, bust that screen. So you got to be careful with it. And I've I've gone on the the Rosineer website, and I've I've seen people talking about how it's like oh it's a horrible machine, don't buy it, yada yada. I'm just like you got to know how to use it. You got to. Uh, first and foremost, do a little bit of research on rosin pressing and see what kind of temperatures that you're uh, supposed to be pressing at, you know, find your temperature range and see what you like, you know. The brain but, um, says it's becoming more of a skill. Three or 30 minutes. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Brain, what do you say? Like, given a choice, what would you say? Three or 30 minutes? 30 minutes of what? Well, well, you know, pressing, like slowing no, 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 down. So what you're saying, like, you never want to press more than not, not press pushing the technology too much. Oh, you no. Um, I don't know. Well, like, as far as uh, doing the uh, hash and whatnot, I have not had the pleasure of being able to press hash yet. You know, I don't even have any of those little pressing screens yet. But believe me, I've been having a blast with pressing out flour and uh, having plenty of concentrates to have on hand. But um, when I do my presses, sometimes, like, okay, if it's my first press, that thing will uh, generally press down pretty softly all the way down with about five seconds from the time you press it down to the time it clamps down. And if you're, like, on your third press, you got to be a little more gentle with it. You uh, Sometimes you'll have to go up to maybe 30 seconds from the time the plates make contact to the time you're all the way clamped down, maybe even longer than that, depending on how much material you're pressing. And with me, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a really comfortable doing presses at um, about one gram of flour right now. And my returns are coming out pretty good. The rosin press is not uh, busting the parchment paper even on the third press. What it size depends plates? on how much. Uh, what the size plates, plates are like? I want to say three by three, three inch by three inch square. But yeah, it's pretty much like between a, a gram, gram and a half, two grams, yeah. I guess. But uh, using this little. Uh, pollen press that I use to press it into pucks before I press it out with the rosin press. About a gram and a half is the most I'm really able to do with that thing. And, you, and it's, it's giving me really good returns on the first press just pressing it into a little puck. You have the, you bought the Dake press, right? The Dake, is it a 10 ton? No, no, press? I got the rosin here. It's the... Um, it's pretty much the most affordable one on the market right now for the home user. You know, I always say that for the home user because, uh, like I just said, the plates are pretty small, three by three. You know, you can. It's it's definitely for the personal user, but it is uh, definitely worth the investment. Um, like I was saying last time, the retail on it is four hundred, and you can get it off of Amazon and eBay. But uh, if you contact the um, I think his name is Bob Lee. If you contact him directly, he'll actually give you a coupon code to use for your purchase, and it brings it down to I think like 360. I think it was like 10% off, something like that. <laughs> so yeah, 360. And um, I, yeah, I would absolutely recommend uh, recommend it. It looks like it only does up to about a thousand psi. Is that right? Says 100. Yeah, I don't think the psi is very high on it. <clears throat> I can't remember. I think it's even lower than that, to be honest, Steve. Uh, when I went and looked on the description on Amazon, I think it actually shows what it is, and it may actually be lower than that. I'm looking on their website right now. I was trying to... Uh, 
Let's see. Maybe look on really, the reviews or questions or something like that. Pressure all, one you know, to 150 psi. But okay, pressure yeah, is yeah, all yeah. about the size of your puck. You know what I mean? The size yeah, of the, 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 the about, thing uh, that you're pressing. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You so concentrate that you, into a tiny little, as small right, space as you, possible, then you're doing even better. Yeah. Hey, so if you have a very how small. Puck is, it's how girthy it is. <laughs> What's that? It ain't how long your puck is. It's how girthy it is. <laughs> and also, and also, it's the temperature <laughs> is related to pressure. So. You need so, more, generally it's thought that you need more pressure if you use lower temperatures. So, so. let's just say, and we'll, I'll go over this because this is something else I learned in Frenchie's class. <clears throat> so let's say you, you're someone listening on the show right now. You have some plants. Um, you can make some bubble. You know, you can order, you know, 40 or $60 bubble bags online, uh, or you already have some, or you happen to live near a t shirt place and you can get some t shirt fabric and make your own uh, screen printing fabric and make your own bags. Or you can dry sift that way. So say you have a little bit of bubble hash or a little bit of dry sift or keef. What you can do is you can take it and um, uh, keef you can is a little bit rough, tougher, but you could take the the, the hash and put it into a ball. Um, the the keef you could put into a little tiny pile, okay? But you're going to do like maybe a half gram or a gram at most, okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to take that and you're going to put it on... Um, uh, uh, like cellophane, like turkey bags, okay? And then you put your, um, and they have, there's diff different kinds. Um, I know Frenchie has actually a particular like food grade one that's a little bit better than some of the normal turkey bags out there. But um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's any truth behind, and maybe you guys can talk about if there's any truth behind um, the, uh, the, the, them selling, uh, putting something in the bag to, to fuck with the weed smells and stuff. Uh, I don't know if that's urban legend or not, but um, we'll have to look that up. But um, so what you do is you take your your hash, so you got your bubble hash or your dry sift or your your keef or whatever. Put about a half gram or a gram of that on a piece of the the plastic from the turkey bag. And you put your other piece of uh, on the top of that, you know, other piece of turkey bag. So you're sandwiched, okay, in the clear, uh, and then you put that on a hard surface. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take a um, bottle or not a bottle, a um, a pot and you're going to boil some water and get it just to boiling and you're going to get a funnel and a, um, a, a wine bottle and what you or even a beer bottle will work but a wine bottle is a little better um, you can pour in your your boiling water or just off of boiling water into the uh, thing put your wine cork in it you know your rubber cork in it put your gloves on and you can use that to roll it and that's going to be about 180 to 200 degrees exactly where we want for a rosin press and if you push down hard and slow you roll it four to six times or even eight to ten times and you can actually get something that's extremely similar to rosin uh, um for you know 20 bucks maybe yeah. <laughs> um, no, no two thousand dollar press no four hundred dollar press yeah, and granted that, you know, the consistency will be slightly different and it's not going to be just the same as rosin, but it'll be damn close and it'll look like rosin and it'll smell like rosin and it'll smoke like rosin. Uh, it basically is rosin. Sounds good. Valentine's Day is coming up. Yeah. So, but if you're, if I think we're getting a lot home, of feedback from Roger's mic. Oh, sorry. Wow, it was not, uh, we didn't have a problem all night, did we? And all of a sudden, every now and then an exit. <laughs> so um but yeah if you are at home and you're just you're you're salivating and all this you don't have money for a press if you got a wine bottle with no label on it and uh you know a funnel and some boiling water you you and a turkey bag you know you can uh, or some even some ziplocs you know if something's going to yeah. take the heat and, and heat that heat like while you're boiling your water you take that wine bottle and you're doing the hot water out of your hot water heater you're getting that bottle hot, as hot yes. as you can get it, before you put your boiling water in it. You're not going to take a cold bottle <laughs> and put hot boiling water in it. That's just called busted bottle. It'll yeah, crack. It'll shatter your bottle. Uh, yeah, no, you bring up a good point. You do need to put your bottles <clears throat> in the water as you boil them. Thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> But yeah, so if, if you are looking for a super cheap way to just to make some rosin at home or make something that you can dab and you have some some keef or some bubble or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, there you go. Now you can make some, you know, ghetto rosin, basically. <laughs> or, 
or yeah. craft rosin, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying it is ghetto, but it's artisan. It's artisan. Uh, art, artisan. Yeah. Ha artisan. Handmade. Handcrafted. Yeah. I guess is a better way to put it. I don't mean to to, to you ill of that method. Budget. Budget. Press flower then on a budget. Same way. In yeah. fact, here, actually, let me show you. I have a picture of a, a bunch of. Um, I don't know if you could do flour the same way. Uh, I would imagine not. You'd probably get really poor yields. I would imagine you'd get some, but hold on, I got a really good picture. Because people originally started pressing flour with, you know, like hair straighteners and shit like that. Oh, hard yeah. to believe, but true. Back yeah. in the day. Yeah, I started Back doing in the day. To me. <laughs> I, I, I was like Fabio before that. Hold on. Back in the day. So I've been following Frenchie on Instagram for, I don't know, just a few weeks. And I had seen um, him using that technique that you're talking about where he presses that, uh, presses that keef out or whatever. And basically he was describing it as his decarboxylation technique. Yep, it does decarboxylate it as well. So here's, you guys will be able to see. Oh, shit. Well, I'll have to send this to myself. Actually, here, let me send it to myself. <clears throat> I can put it full screen on a screen share. So I want you guys to see this. You can see the difference in the color of the, the, the consistency with the different trichome heads. Um, each one came out different. It was really interesting. Give me two seconds here. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're you know on a shoestring budget, man, that that can be a great way just to uh, you know get your rosin running. I really like how we uh, we keep attention to you know folks who are just like kind of coming up where they might have some limited resources. I, I appreciate you uh, bringing that to the table, Steve. Oh heck yeah! Well, you know, we all—that's how we all started. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, really. I, I, uh, you know, I I grew up. Me and my homies saved seeds from the bud we 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 bought, and and then grew some pots and tied them up into the trees, allegedly, and uh, uh, you know, did it that way in order to give us a way to um, grow in a neighborhood that had a lot of foot traffic. Um, you know, so it's kind of <laughs> allegedly. So it's kind of funny to see how that always works out. So how are we doing in chat? We got any questions? Oh, how you doing, Brain Grow? What's going on with your grow? <laughs> uh, not much. Uh, it's going pretty good. Um, it looks like on the plant that's closest to harvest that it's probably going to need maybe another week or two. I was checking out the trichomes today, as a matter of fact. I had a day off, so I was pretty busy today. That's actually why I was a little bit late on the podcast. But um, I was checking out the trichomes, and right now they're looking mostly clear, and leaves are still pretty green. So she's telling me she needs a little bit more time. And uh, on Ninja Fruit Pheno number three, that is also in dual root zone. That plant is just doing awesome. Uh, it's been flowering since Christmas, uh, and the buds are already putting on some pretty good mass. And I haven't even really been keeping up with it that much, to be honest. You know, it's on the automatic. Everything's on timers or whatnot. I go in there, feed the fish. And sometimes I'll have enough time to get in there and spend some time with the plants. And for the most part, I just kind of get in there and make sure stuff gets done and go to bed, you know, is that kind of situation. But, um, yeah, everything is going pretty good right now. I actually just barely got through uh, cleaning out one of my grow beds because I was having slugs and the new one I was setting up for my uh, kitchen vegetable system. So uh, I actually just put a dual root zone plant mm -hmm. that's going to go right behind uh, Ninja Fruit number one um, in my small budget buildup system, the one that was originally going to be a breeding chamber. But um, I'll have something to go in there as soon as I get that one harvested out. So that's going to be in the uh, extra kitchen system for now. I need to throw some seeds down. Uh, but other than that, you know, just having a blast with my rosin press. I actually just got a new pressure cooker in today. And 
that's actually the main reason why I was late on the podcast because that thing was whistling like crazy and I didn't want to jump on the panel yet while that thing was going off in the background, me not even be able to say anything, you know. But I'm trying to get back on my uh, my college experiments, you know. I never really had much success, but I never really had a decent pressure cooker in the past either. So everything should be nice and sterile, you know. Um, what are you using the pressure cooker for? What are you using? Mycology, for? trying to grow mushrooms. Oh, mushrooms, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I want sterilizing the jars. Your yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to get that done, and I, I had been I had spent some time last year trying to do it, but uh, I didn't really have much success. And every time I would get uh, contamination on my jars or something, I would it would be so long before I would even try it again, you know. So I actually finally spent the money on a pretty badass pressure cooker. What's that? Can I give you a hundred dollar solution? <laughs> What's that? Uh, Harbor Freight. They have $114, I lied, uh, and it's a uh, sandblasting cabinet, okay? You get that sandblasting cabinet, and then around the edges and stuff, it's not made to be 100% sealed. Mm -hmm. Don't fucking worry about it. Just get some of that aluminum, uh, I think it's aluminum or a foil tape <laughs> uh, thing that you use on ducting, uh, on ducting yes. And, and you just do the edges in the in, in that tape. You will make a completely sealed box. You can take filters from breathers at Home Depot, HEPA filter sized uh, round breathers. You can put that for your air coming in. And all you need to do is run negative pressure in there, so you have some kind of fan uh, sucking air out of there, and you have an inoculation hood. For under a hundred and fifty bucks, did I say a hundred dollars? Man, I'm such a liar. But you talking about option. like a uh, laminar flow hood? No, no, you know, like a glass beater in a glass beating chamber, like a glass mm, beater. No, it's like a uh, generally you can stand you, you, up and you, you stick your. It has a, gl a glove holes. And you stick your yeah. In okay, you're talking about a glove box. Oh, okay, okay, glove okay, box. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's made for sandblasting. All right, all right. But you're not going to sandblast in it, so you just have to seal Whoa. it up because you're not sandblasting. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you I know what you're talking about now. I, was, I didn't I didn't catch yeah, on, I mean, for, but yeah, that would that would be an awesome idea, you know. <clears throat> there's actually I've actually looked into that, and there's lots of ideas to do it even cheaper than that, you know, using some cheap uh, starting materials, but uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, like I think we all started yeah, rubber made far, yeah. a rubber made tub and uh, some arm length, <laughs> right? Some arm length yep, gloves yep. and some rubber made and some duct tape, and we're good to go. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm a pansy. <laughs> I'd rather I'd I'd rather spend a couple dollars and and have it nailed, you know. Even if it's ghetto. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. In so, some cases, that's I'm, the best I'm, bet. I'm, like there's there's I'm, you know I'm, there's I'm, ways I'm, to make uh. So I wanted yeah, to, yeah. Quick, real quick, well, I got it pulled up here. Uh, check out, um, so this is the different rosins. So this is this is one of the finer ones. You can see this held up to the light. There's no imperfections in that at all. <laughs> you can see in this one, it's still a little dense there. It needs to be pressed out a little more. <coughs> Sorry. You can see in this one, um, there's still, there's a little bit more grainier material. So there's a little bit of um, contaminant in it, not much. And you can see this one has a lot of contaminant in it. He did just a bunch of ones just that he didn't clean quite as well. So you'd be able to see, you know, perfect, better, or, you know, perfect, uh, not quite as good. And then, you know, something a little bit, uh, a little bit dirtier, but just to give you a kind of comparison to tell you how, how well you're doing when you make stuff. So just wanted to show you guys that up close. That's cool. That's Different micron bag sizes, um, each one of those. Yes, yeah, so the different micron bag sizes and then different runs. So like, this is like wash two or three or four, and this is like wash six or seven. Uh, right on. Eight, and then this is like after ten or something, basically. But he's he does anywhere from eight to using that using that wine bottle technique. Yep. So this was all um, uh, dry, uh, freeze dried uh, bubble hash. Excuse me, that uh, or uh, that's pretty yeah, cool. 
he did freeze dried. Then he also did. I would, I would definitely out. recommend people going on Instagram and checking out the because uh, it's actually a little uh, video on loop where he starts it. It's the fresh, you know, fresh material. I mean, not fresh, but it's before he rolls it, and then he goes over it like two or three times. And every time he goes over it, you can see it just changing color. It looks pretty awesome. So oh, I did talk to Frenchie, and I didn't just realize I was on mute. I was talking to myself. Um, <laughs> Frenchie on the show uh, here um, in a uh, in a couple of weeks. He uh, wasn't able to. I tried to get him on before his class, uh, and then I tried to get him on this week. Um, his schedule didn't allow it. But the next couple of weeks, we are going to have Frenchie on, and he's going to come on and tell us all about it himself. So it'll be really cool and just to learn from him and learn about. Um, you know, he is such a incredible understanding of the trichomes and the trichome heads and the chemistry that's going on and it was just incredible to hear and, and how much he's learned just by working with the trichome heads he doesn't look at the flower structure at all he's just looking at the heads that's it he doesn't give a shit at you know how it looks or how fluffy it is because he's looking for resin he doesn't you know when you're growing for hash you don't care if it's a big fluffy plant as long as it's coated right. in resin the plant is a thc factory it's a trichome exactly. head factory yep right however it so, does it right on so he, he he was talking he, he had about a whole oil, oil farmers about, yeah he had a whole 10 minute talk about how uh, it took him years to like see the bud and like see the plant structure because he was so used to just ignoring all of that <laughs> it was kind of interesting to hear it's like the reverse of what we go through you know it was very strange but it was really cool so but uh, also, uh, uh, Frenchie is a uh, uh, he. He works with the plant, but he, he doesn't really uh, not not as much on the growing. But he can tell you a whole hell of a lot about the plant because of the rosin heads and, and all different tricks and stuff. But uh, it was just kind of funny. Uh, I'm still asking him a grow question. He's like, "I am a wine maker. I make the wine. I leave the growers to grow it." You know, in his awesome accent. And uh, oh man. Uh, it was just great, and I, I cannot recommend that class enough. He's doing one uh, coming up on dry sifting, and I 100% plan on taking that class as well. And if any, you know, I will make sure that we mention the dates on his other class when he teaches again uh, uh, next time in San Francisco, um, because uh, man, it, if that wasn't ever one of the most informative classes I've ever taken. So, speaking of classes, I, I heard um, I heard you took notes. Oh yes, I took actually took it lots of notes. So good, took you took notes. notes. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, Charlie Schultz, uh, Ken Armstrong, and I, and Jessica Patton are all teaching a big commercial aquaponics cannabis class, or aquaponics, regular aquaponics commercial class, four days, um, in um, uh, at Ouroboros Farms, and uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be awesome in Half Moon Bay. Uh, that'll be in March, on March twenty first, twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth. Um, it also includes a farm to table dinner with a four star chef. Um, uh, we have a chef that uh, we sell stuff to uh, in the city, and he comes out and does our farm to tables. So you'll actually have a dinner at the farm, uh, you know, from a five star chef uh, uh, right there. So it'll be awesome. Uh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Great salad. Yep. And, uh, so that's coming up. Um, the next cannabis class, I believe, is uh, February. Uh, 10th and 11th, I think. I got to double check. I'm pretty sure it's February 10th and 11th for the next aquaponic cannabis class in Half Moon Bay. Um, you can go on ouroborosfarms.com. They have a whole list of schedule. We did the schedule up to, I think, June. Uh, we just got to finish the rest of the year. But um, uh, yeah, if you're looking for some cool experiences and some cool knowledge, definitely check that out. Um, uh, what else is going on? Um... A lot of stuff happening up in Canada. Um, uh, a lot of things moving and shaking up there. Uh, in the weed industry, uh, especially in regards to us. Can't talk anything more beyond that, but things are looking up in, in Canada now uh, in terms of uh, sooner than later. And then, um, yeah, everything else is going great. So it's interesting to see how the market's been reacting to this Jeff Session stuff. And then uh, everyone seems just to be shifting to Canada, which is kind of interesting. So. <laughs> I, I, I just pulled out all my old VCR copies of Northern Exposure 
working on my accent and you know i might be thinking about canada i feel canadian i i spent a lot of time up in the maritimes i used to spend summers up in cape breton and uh, places up there prince edward island i love it up there i want to be a canadian <laughs> i'm ready um so Indi Indi indica dogo uh, asks how close is San Diego? Um, we're about eight hours from San Diego, I would say. Tommy, you say about that seven, eight hours, depending on traffic and how fast you drive. Uh, up to half moon. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can easily do it in eight hours. Even dealing with like you get stupid and you get stuck in a bit of LA traffic, you can still do it in eight hours. If yeah. you, if you plan it, you know, like making one of those coastal runs, you can do it in six and a quarter uh but i i never i i always just give it eight yep so but yeah so we'll, no, we'll have a bunch of classes uh coming up uh at least once or twice a month at ouroboros this year uh, along with the really cool large commercial classes so that'll be awesome and uh yeah uh, i think that's about it i don't know if anything else going on um, working on getting some more guests lined up. This weekend's going to be awesome. I'm at the um, Regenerative. Hold on, let me make sure I get the name right. Um, the Science of Organic Regenerative Cannabis Conference. <laughs> Apparently, I've been saying the wrong word all day. I thought it was the Regenerative Organic Cannabis Conference, but that's okay. Um, uh, and that's in Pacific um, Portland uh, this weekend, um, starting tomorrow uh, through Monday. And uh, also, if anyone's in Portland and wants to hang out for a sesh, I think uh, me and a bunch of the DGC are going to end up over at um, um, Northwest Cannabis Club on Monday night. Um, I don't know what time yet. I'll make an announcement on the channel. Um, but if anyone's interested, um, you know, please come check it out. That place, I think it's 10 bucks to get in. And if you've yeah. never been there before, it's 10 bucks for your yearly membership. It's like 20 or 25 bucks for, you know, to get in. Uh, and that lasts you for a year. Um, and then you just pay. It's like five or ten bucks after that when you just show up. But it's a really. I, cool I got my card. I got my card for there. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a good place. It's totally worth going to, everybody. Good super place. super awesome place. Good, it's good like people. a high end uh, old timey bar, you know, real nice woodwork and everything with live music and uh, dab rigs and joints and uh, snacks and all kinds of cool stuff. But you can smoke there. It's like a lounge. It's like a bar, but you smoke weed, but they don't sell weed. You bring your own. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a speakeasy for weed. Yeah. So you bring your own rigs or whatever. BYO, BYOW. Bring, bring your own flapper. Bring your own yep. flapper too. Yeah. Yeah. But they do have some public stuff you can use. I mean, they have house ones you can use. And I think they even have some bigger ones you can rent too. So it's like five bucks or something. And, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool place, especially if you're looking to just bring someone in from out of town or maybe people that haven't smoked or not used to it or just, you know, want a meeting place that you can all meet at and um, and smoke. I haven't been to iBake yet. Is that the one in Denver? Or is that in Portland as well? Someone asked, is it better than iBake? I'm not sure. But um, anyways, yeah, so come check it out this weekend. We'll be up here and... Uh, yeah. Uh, does anyone else have anything else for the show? Uh, why don't you go tell everybody where you're at um, uh, Brain Grow? Why don't you tell people how to find you? Uh, make sure you go check out ilovegrowingmarijuana.com so you can check out my grow. And then uh, make sure you check out my YouTube channel. I'm definitely going to be releasing a YouTube video within the next seven days, hopefully before the next show. And uh, Instagram, you know, I've been on Instagram for a while, so make sure you follow me there. Awesome. What about you, Marty? Or have you, uh, I think he got kid aggro a little earlier. Um, what about you, Mr. Green Jeans? Uh, yeah, greenjeansgarden.com. Joined I Love Growing Marijuana. Uh, as well, I joined the website uh, a couple days awesome. ago. So oh, I'll cool! I didn't see that. I'm I'll have to go check it out. Give you a bump up. I'll be stalking you. Yeah, I think I I think I said I was Mr. Green Jeans. I'm pretty sure. I've... <laughs> also, uh, 
made Mr. Green. So I'm a moderator and, and now Mr. Green Jeans is a moderator. So for those of you that don't like Facebook and you don't like um, whatever our other option, I think that's our only other option right now for a, a text community. We have um, the Aquaponic Cannabis Growers Facebook group on Reddit. I'm sorry, Aquaponic, uh, Aquachronic group on Reddit. Um, or Reddit slash Aquachronic. Aquachronic. That's nice. Aquachronic, yeah, I like that too. Or, um, no, it's no, not Aquachronic. It's Aquaponic Chronic. Yeah. Aquaponic Chronic. Okay. <laughs> but if you go to the our Reddit Aquaponics, it's on the bar on the right for um, you know affiliated Reddits. Uh, and um, so yeah, it's another community for everyone if they're looking for a place to um, and don't want to deal with the Facebook shit, um, can go and post you know on Reddit and and share their experiences and and share knowledge and stuff. So um, you know, please check that out, Mr. Green Jeans. I just made him a moderator over there as well to help out there. And um, if you guys are looking for a place, um, uh, you know, I've also thought about doing a, a, a Google group uh, just, again, to get away from Facebook. I, I slowly want to migrate away from it. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep up the Facebook group. Don't get me wrong, but I want to um, find a better central platform because they're, uh, Facebook has censored the ever-loving crap out of our ability to share the show. Um, yes. Uh, no matter who posts Stay it. off Facebook. And... Uh, they're, they're just because of this ad shit and YouTube is also doing that. So it took from August until now for our um, average views to go back to where they were because they delisted the show because it's not suitable for advertisers because we talk about cannabis. So we went from being uh, now I haven't even made a hundred dollars off the channel since the beginning of the channel's existence, just full transparency. And I'm not in for cash. It only matters because it affects the S SEO and I don't, it doesn't get listed as high on search engines and stuff. So less people end up finding the content and that pisses me off because we spend a lot of time and effort to put it together, bring in good guests and have good discussions and provide good content and try to research stuff and not provide bad content uh, and correct stuff that's out there that's wrong. And, and, and it makes it that much harder for us um, to yeah. even. And we just give so, away good, good knowledge that saves people money, you know, saves them stupid mistakes when they're, you know, all they're concerned about is getting some meds to a loved one. Yeah, that, that, that sucks. Yeah. So, I mean, they totally just crippled. I mean, you can see the exact date that they changed the monetization thing because my view count just plummeted. Um, especially on, so I have um, one of my highest viewed view videos per week is a, a video on um, uh, how to and when to top your clones. And it is, I have over 70,000 views on that. And I, it's only like a year or two old. Um, I mean, it gets hundreds of views per week. And uh, that was monetized and they demonetized it uh, randomly one day. And then what's really bullshit now, here, you know what? I'm just going to show you guys how ridiculous Facebook is right now. Or not Facebook, YouTube. You guys aren't going to believe this when I show you. So you guys have seen the um, on the channel the... Uh, the videos with the seedlings, right? Yeah, yeah, I've seen them. So let me show you this. Make sure there's nothing that I don't. YouTube want. exposed. Yeah. Top ten mysteries that prove why aliens <laughs> interbred with our females. <laughs> um. So here, I'm gonna I'm gonna screen share and show you guys just how ridiculous the current monetization thing is. Because you guys are this is something I've been wanting to bitch about, but I have been kind of holding my tongue, but I think I'm gonna bitch about it tonight for a second. So I can't bitch about what I really want to bitch about, but you guys will find out why soon enough. <laughs> Tommy's smirking because he knows. Um uh, so I'd be look at itching to do some bitching. Oh, yeah, but you guys are going to hear about it on the news when I do my bitching. I'll leave it at that. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it'll be a, it'll be, yeah. it'll be nice. Yeah, it's um, not a high school thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so look at this. Here we go. Garden update number four, germination. Okay. Not a single word of cannabis or weed or anything in there. Unmonetizable. Limited to no ads. How do seed plant post-germination? Monetizable. <laughs> Seed, how do seeds start? Monetizable. How to start your seedlings and grow update? Monetizable. <laughs> so how is it that this one isn't, <laughs> but these three are? What the hell? 
It's the same it's, thing. It's it's a it's a quantum algorithm thing. It's it's insane. Yeah, it's, it's Heisenberg's YouTube. Haters YouTube. gonna hate. Well, they're just they're they're flagging stuff that's on. Um, Somebody from Big Pharma was like, "Oh, we can't have this." Oh, and uh, I will have a nutrient introduction video. I uh, I was not happy with the audio of the original one I I put together this week, and uh, I want to redo the audio on it at the farm. And uh, I'm gonna start doing some some nutrient one off nutrient stuff videos on individual things just to try and uh, get a little more video content on. I'm gonna have more grow content. Try my point. I'm trying to get up to five four or five days a week of content for you guys. Um, uh, you know, even if they're shorter videos, uh, you know, one to two minute videos, uh, just to try and up the content on the channel. So just as a heads up. So, um, but yeah, just to give you guys an idea of of. And 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 when it means it's not monetizable, it cripples. Like you don't get in that shared recommended bar on the right hand side. People have to specifically search for you, uh, and stuff like that. So the other big uh, video I've had on here lately is the um, decarboxylation video uh, that that we did with. Uh, so I did you're on, saying on like bar. the series that we're talking about doing. Of, of really laying it out for people and, and and so that they can see how to do all these processes in like three short videos they're not going to even let that be promoted they're going to hide that yep no it's total bs like like it depends on what it, what it is too um but for, you know what's funny so here's another great example so how to how to decarboxylation what is and how to decarboxylate your plant material uh, is monetizable with 24,000 views or two views away from 24,000. Okay. But I have basically the identical video. <laughs> okay. The only difference was which kitchen it was shot in. It's shot at a different location. How to property decarboxylation using Mason's jars. <laughs> that one is not monetizable and only has 4,000 views. Even though the search engine basically is going to pop up, you know, next to each other if I do it. But if you do it as a third party, the other one comes up way higher on the list because it's monetizable. So it's that's the reason why you'll hear cannabis people bitch. It's not because they're trying to get money. Some of them are, but most of them, it's just it's crippling our views so that, you know, it just makes it harder for people to find our channels. Um, uh, and a lot of people aren't aware of that problem right now. So I just wanted to mention that real quick. Sorry for going off on a tangent. No, no that's the, that's the man trying to keep this knowledge down. And yeah, and I'm actually a corporate bitch. I'm working for a corporation that I'm in love with and I want to see it grow, but there's another side of it. Yeah. This, that's pretty sucky actually. So that's the reason why I want to move the community to a different thing. Um, either eventually putting something up on Potent Ponix just as a an AP forum or something, uh, or um, you know setting something up on Reddit and just using the Reddit section as a as a safe place that we can all post videos and stuff and not have to worry about you know stupid search engine bullshit. But just keep sharing the information. That's what it's about. Yep. Hey Tommy, I wanted yeah. to talk a little bit about edibles with you, buddy. Um, for one, I had a question. I actually had two questions. First one is, uh, will THC bind to liquid lecithin by itself? Like, say you have a concentrate and you add that uh, with lecithin, you know, like rosin, add that straight up with lecithin. Maybe heat it up. Will it bind to the lecithin by itself? Uh, to a degree. There are things that you can do, and it starts getting into thousands of dollars to encourage that even more. Uh, but for the you know average person doing it, no, it, it's it's way more than sufficient uh, to get the job done. Uh, when you start getting like on an industrial scale, you start doing some other crap that's, you know, kind of like out of the pharmaceutical industry. But yeah, even just mixing it up with a blender, uh, having it, you know, warm when you're mixing it, not, not too hot, like, you know, 150 degrees is fine, Fahrenheit, uh, you know, mixing that up. 
uh, if you if you have a large enough amount, you know, you put it in the blender. Uh, that really helps things along. Uh, up from there, you start getting to some very specific uh, pieces of equipment that are meant for shearing and, and, and binding kind of stuff. It really gets a little weird after that. Gotcha. And uh, the second question I had was, have you ever tried to make cannabis-infused honey? No, I have not done that. I've read about it, and um, I've, I've read several things about it, and I just turned my head sideways because honey does not possess any of the properties that you're looking for in a solvent, which is what you want it to be. Uh, you want right. to, it's like, that sounds cute, but why? And nobody's ever explained <laughs> that. Uh, so, I mean, there are, there are things you could do, like you could do your extracts and incorporate that into the honey. You could uh, do the coconut oil and then put the honey in the coconut oil after you do the process with the infused coconut oil. Like, you? yeah, yeah. So yeah. One, one thing that I, I'd go. I mean, that was actually since one of I've my gotten the rosin press, I felt like. Sensory is what you're talking about there. Yeah. Yeah. Since I've gotten the rosin press, I feel like that's my best solution to making edibles from here on out. Like you can extract the exact amount of oil that you want to add to whatever recipe you want to make. And then the rosin chips, I've thought about uh, leaving them left over and then running them through like a food processor or like the uh, magic bullet that'll powderize it and then add that into flour, you know, when I make recipes or something like that, you know? Yeah. Are, are you after like get baked recipes or are you after more medicinal recipes? And when you say rosin or rosin chips, are you talking about like your pressed flour left over? Or are you talking about like do you put it in yeah, a bag? Yeah, the pressed flour left over. Oh, so you're not fil you're not using filter bags. No, I I, was, I mentioned that earlier. I haven't even got filter bags yet. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, like for edibles, I'm gonna sing yeah, the just for edibles. Yeah, for edibles, I'm gonna sing the praises of ethanol. Thank you very much. And I'm going to sing the praises of warm extraction. And don't worry about leaving it in there for a while. It does not fucking matter if you eat some of these waxes and things like that in your edible product. Right. Well, well, I'm, well, the way I'm the way I'm talking about doing it, you're using the entire. Uh, you're using everything anyway, because you press out the rosin and then you add that into say a butter or whatever you know whatever you want to use. And then take the rosin chips and grind them into a powder and use that yes. as well. You, you utilize know. those chips like that. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So, uh, so what we do, what I do with my rosin chips, if that's what you want to call them, is the uh, we put ours in the bag and then they have the pressed bags with the rosin or plant material. We cook them down in coconut oil and I can actually pull the rest of the resin out of there. Works really good. Right, yeah, if I was to extract them again, I would definitely go with the ethanol method like Tommy was talking about if I wanted to do like an extraction or something like that. I feel like that would be most effective. Is ethanol more effective than using a saturated fat? Yes, eth Tommy. well, <laughs> ethanol, <laughs> now we're talking about, let's be specific, we're talking about trailings. We've already taken the juicy stuff off. We're talking how do we get the rest of the stuff out of the trailings. Ethanol is very racist. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's already garbage. Can we pull something out of it? <laughs> well, so so Duarte says uh, clear Everclear 190 is hard to get. Yeah, it is, but you can you can get something that's <laughs> not. You can get like you know one. Unless you can walk down to your local it. liquor store like I can and buy it. <laughs> And, yeah. and if I can be honest, when I say ethanol, 190 is not good enough. Yep. It has to be 200. Explain that, because a lot of people okay. don't understand. Okay. There's a couple things going on. There's polarity. Let's think about it like a magnet, okay? And so there are things that you want out of the plant, 
and the alcohol has its own kind of a magnet field that's going to go for the things you want and water has another kind of polarity magnet field going after these things and they're actually in a bit of a competition you can get the job done but if you're going after it you really 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 want to have that water out of there um, and and just be able to focus on one of those magnet kind of fields and it's just polarity of for, for grabbing the stuff out of, out of the plant that you're after um, so al alcohol extractions you know especially like if you're 150 you know like if you're doing 151 rum or something like that anything below that it's it's not the same as the potential that you have there in very very super concentrated ethanol uh, extractions and and with that really super concentrated ethanol you're actually able to grab some more terpenes uh, that you're not able to do even with like five percent water in there weird it's just chemistry you know do you want to tell them a little bit about a, a ghetto uh um, what is it? The the a pressure cooker, and you can screw in the the on the the valve. You can make a still out of it. I've seen people do that before online. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I was looking at that too. There, uh, there are better ways to go. Uh, you you can go full on redneck. I hate my peeps. I'm, I'm not saying anything bad here. Uh, but there are stainless steel stills that are available. Uh, and you can get into this kind of stuff for under $2,000. Uh, I would go for a reflux still. And don't do any packing. You're going to have to manufacture some parts on your own so they're out of stainless and stuff. Uh, or you could use like uh, a stainless steel kind of like uh, marbles and really? uh, kind of nuggets because uh, you don't need to pull the sulfides out you're just you're just trying to recapture the highest proof if you will uh, uh, resurgence through the thing so you, you're gonna set a still up and you can buy that stuff cheaper than you can make it honest to God I don't care how resourceful you are you can buy this stuff cheaper than you can make it you still are gonna want to pack the things uh, differently but by controlling the temperature at the top of the still and at the uh, condensation point, you can get your still balanced to where the temperatures are just right and all the stuff is floating up the still, but you're really not getting anything out. And then by simply changing the condensing temperatures at the top, you start pulling the ethanol out. It's very, very, very high proof. So you can do this stuff. So like if you start with 151 Bacardi, if that's all you can get wherever you are, uh, you can start running two or three runs through a, uh, a reflux still, and you can make your own 200 proof. Uh, and there's some uh, actual, like if you want to get stupid about it, which I suggest, there are beads and stuff that will, uh, dihydrate <laughs> stuff that will pull the last remaining water out of it. When you extract with that kind of ethanol compared to any ethanol that you've done before, it'll blow you away, man. Ethanol is actually really pretty cool. Uh, and if you, and then when you're trying to get the ethanol out of the last of your wash, you're trying to do that in as broad of a surface area as you can. And that's the trick. Get, getting that, that, you know, a much bigger surface area to let that ethanol come out. Uh, when you're doing your extraction at the end there but yeah you can get some really good medicine like that even out of trash like we're talking about here uh, brain drop. interesting thank you for all of that sir yeah diy with tommy all right well um what uh how do people find you roger <laughs> Well, I'm, we're, we're getting, we're, we're in our slow, we're doing a little bit of, I'm at lilovegrowingmarijuana.com and uh, I'm working on some websites that uh, 
no use in mentioning them yet. I don't like people to show up before I got them ready. Uh, might have something for you and your uh, situation, you know, about Facebook and all somewhere you can call your own and do and promote and use your SEOs the way you want to. Uh, I might be able to help you out with that. It just simply put you on a server that, you know, I, you know, you can always get your own too. It's really not that hard. I don't know if you've ever done it, but you can actually go. So you have to watch out though. Some hosting places don't like cannabis either, <laughs> but, but uh, if you find a, a good hosting company that doesn't have a problem with you promoting cannabis, you can just buy your own little hosting account for a few bucks a month and put all the websites and little links and stuff and promote all you want to do so i know it's gonna be i'll good. look forward to talking to you about about that later maybe you know um but uh i'm just hanging out at the forum uh helping the guys out uh we got a great moderation team there and hell i i end up working with them helping them out with issues that they have across the membership or you know on the forum more than i do actually getting to help people grow half the time anymore i'm kind of i just took a few days because of this winter we had and you know, I asked uh, Robert to give me a few days. I didn't have to go and be responsible for, you know, the, anything on the forum because I needed a break. I just celebrated my three years working with I Love Growing Marijuana dot com, which is really cool. And uh, and they took care they took care of me, you know, over Christmas and all the everybody that all the moderators, you know, they get, you know, we we promote a lot of things for Amazon and. Uh, the company gets affiliate fees for doing that. And every Christmas they buy you all the moderators, nice present or let them pick what they want on Amazon up to, you know, like if they give them a big gift card and all. So we just went through that and uh, finally got all the, I love the uh, 12 days of Christmas contest winners taken care of. I think, I think there might be one or two stragglers that weren't able to use the codes we gave them, you know, and uh, that's about it. I'm just hanging out here at the farm. Uh, trying to get um, this cold snap over. I think we're going to have a nice week, and I'm going to get outside and do some work. And uh, I think I've got my my greenhouse is all grown over with blackberries. I think I'm going to go harvest all of that matter, the entire plants and all, and do some uh, do some ferments so I can do some experiments along the lines of what we talked about last week, mm -hmm. where we try to do the grow. Um, uh, you know, with uh, just the ferment, you know, the, the blackberry ferment, you know, since it's got the silica and, suppose, you know, all the other uh, necessary uh, nutrition. So I'm looking forward to seeing if that actually, how, how well that works out, because I can always throw a plant at an experiment like that just to see what it overall comes. I don't need to do a side by side right now. I just want to see that I can grow a nice little plant, you know, that gets a decent yield and high quality organic matter in the end, you know. What do you say? All them, all them heads, <laughs> all them trichomes. <laughs> so a million heads are better than, one. better than one. That's right. That's right. So, and I appreciate all you guys that come over and join. I think it's a nice, it's a mature forum, you know, and I, I appreciate Mr. Green Jeans. I didn't realize you, you had gone ahead and joined. I missed that. Well, because I, maybe because I was on vacation, you know, like I said, till go till on Monday, this Monday. And uh, and Brain Grow does a great job over there, and he's got a few people. In fact, you know, we can attribute a couple of people that follow the show now live uh, from Brain Grow's activity on the forum. So it's kind of working both ways. So it's really cool. Yeah, to trying to keep that aquaponic that uh, side active over there, you know. <laughs> well, it's new to a lot of people, you know, I mean, in a way. It's not new, but it's new to a lot of people, especially there. So when we opened that part of the forum, it did give people an option. And but you got a, a few people following you along. I mean, seems like you got some interest in there, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Indica Doggo, and I mean, probably about two or three other people that regularly comment on there that I just can't think of off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, and it'll take time because, you know, um, there's so many forums and like you said, you know, like, like we were talking about, there's so many Facebook groups now, whether it be a monetized uh, site or, or a group or whatever, 
that you know a, a lot of people don't go to the forums as much anymore for that stuff too i i think it's uh something that takes a little time because i'd like to see more interest in it yeah i definitely agree um, there like it's not it's not their first um their first place to look you know Mm-hmm. but it's it generally is probably the best place um, so yeah it is nice to have the have the culture go started there though so we can have so we can share that knowledge because i think the more as it we continue to grow and have many new members uh all the time and i think that you know it'll just be a matter of c- continuing to you got already got everybody in their niches and their grow journals you got some massive grow journals going on there you know, with a bunch of different techniques and uh, I don't force anybody into their technique. I kind of let them, if they put their own grow journal out, uh, they want to teach their technique. I just let them go. I let the membership, you know, decide whether they want any part of it or whether they think there's anything viable in their methods and teaching. So it's pretty open. And uh, as long as you're decent to other people and treat people decently, you know, kind of like, kind of like I, I, live and let live uh, and don't cuss out and call people stupid we're good to go over there so so what you want to say Tom? So, so, so oh, i'm a, just saying data talks bullshit see talks. we have a question in yeah, chat yeah. here uh, where can i buy 200 proof alcohol uh the only place uh i've been able to source it is through people that have uh farming kinds of operations going on uh I was going to say, uh, I was going to say Ag Supply. Yeah. Uh, and Find so, an Ag Supply in your region, and they might even deliver it to you a lot cheaper than you could ever imagine. Because yeah, they have trucks and routes. You know? talk to Find your local people, moonshine maker. People in your area. No, 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 better than moonshine. Much better. Uh, it's a, and it's actually. Yeah, but I'm saying they have all the equipment. You can just explain the process to them. Yeah, they're actually. It's, it's, actually pretty tricky making the 200 proof uh, especially the food grade and, and i insist on the food grade uh you either need somebody who's getting it by 55 gallon drums or somebody who's breaking it down but if you talk to five people in your area that are involved in your same hobby you'll find the person who has the 200 proof i mean it's just it's basically a solvent that professional extractors use what is uh tommy what is food grade ethanol like uh oh yeah i guess that's that kind of a ever clear us. yeah you're getting the ethanol that you want to use you're 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 going to spend and you're going to spend some money on this don't get me wrong uh and that's why you want your still because you want to keep recapturing because it's expensive uh you're easily looking at about a hundred dollars a gallon for your solvent this this is not stuff that you you mix up in the bathtub with a bass motor for the 200 proof yep yeah so you're this is highly refined pharmaceutical food grade you know kind of stuff it's actually one step under pharmaceutical grade so this is not even ethanol that you're looking at putting in with uh, fuel mixtures or different stuff like that, or you know, all the stuff. This is point blank. You can deal with this as food. Now you would never do that to somebody because 200 proof ethanol would kill them. But it's, it's it's totally clean enough to be using in those processes. And w- when I'm doing extracts, that's the only stuff I'm willing to use. Now it's expensive, which is why I recapture it. Uh, and I go through uh, refluxing to recapture because it lets some of the terpenes and the things that are escaping drop back down into the uh, into the column, and then you're only capturing a, a very uh, high grade uh, ethanol at the end that you can r- run back through your system. And the food grade, it basically it just comes back in simple terms. It's just a matter of that. That's a rating that determines that it is safe and pure enough to use to make food that could be edible and sold in yes. a store. Yeah, this is used a lot That's in agriculture, cleaning equipment, and things like that. Right. There's some things like in agriculture, you don't want to spray bleach on them. You, you need, you know, solvents like this. And then there's other uh, things across multiple industries related with a processing product that, you know, is grown that ethanol is the, the ultimate solvent for it. 
So it's out there and people in your area who are involved in the same hobby that you are, uh, you talk to five of them, within five people, you're going to find the person who knows where that is in your local area. He's got the 200 proof plug. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 so, do, do, do side by side. It'll blow you away how much better the, the solvent is and how much easier it is to pull out. And it's just it's really pretty trippy. Just, just that last 5% of water. So there's a, um, let me find it here. Uh, okay, there's a question in chat. Have you guys seen the extract cracker turbo? It's like a magic butter machine, but it's for ethanol extracts and recovers the alcohol. It's five ninety nine on Amazon. Yes, I've never heard of. I've that. seen that. Yes, it hasn't. It's only been out about two years, and it hasn't had a lot of reviews um, by a lot of other people. It looks really interesting. It looks like an interesting Ooh, thing, but it's like a very new cracker. product. Yeah, it actually it recycles the ethanol, so it, you know, it. Uh, that's the idea of it is that it, uh, and. Uh, how how many feet? you can you can get like a countertop distiller where you can actually do something like that where you use no. your uh, ethanol as your solvent no. and then redistill it. Yeah, you can't. How many this feet tall is, is it? How many feet tall is it? It's very small. It's assuming that you've already it washed. Do it. it doesn't do you've it. You've already done a wash. No, it doesn't do it. it. It has nothing to do with that side. Everything you're saying is absolutely 100% true. You can capture everything you want out of the plant, but now it's a different thing you have to think about. It's like, okay, how do I get the alcohol back out of that? Yeah, and that's you, what this is. All it this thing is for is like assuming you've several, already got the wash. You need several feet of column, and and you need to you know, like either be running bubblers or uh, different kinds of uh, packing in the column to cause the refluxing in the column to keep pulling. Let's call it solids out of the column so that only the alcohol evaporates off. The problem with the solvent, the best solvent you got, is a solvent that's really, really close to the thing you want. It's just a little bit more harsh. And that's the case of ethanol compared to the things we're after in cannabis. So you you need to physically- This thing is a, it's a vacuum device. It, it's a, it has a vacuum. It vacuums, it takes help. it down. Vacuum to a certain temperature but it's still not going to get you to 200 though you need to have the um uh what's it called again tommy the thing that bubbles at the top i was well, skeptical they're, they're, it's called a reflux column that's it oh it is really what you need to do and then there are actually things you want to do to pimp out your reflux column along the way um and you see those, uh, you'll see those reflux columns on like the short path distillers. If you ever see the short path distillers, and it has that funky, um, weird, almost percolator looking um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, contraption, mm -hmm. that, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, right there where the temperature changes. Yep. Can't you just use? You can just use a little. Temperature. You can just use a vacuum chamber, a vac well, degassing well, chamber. The physics remain the same at lower bar pressure. You still, no matter what your pressure is, you could do it at the top of the mountain or at sea level, or you could induce a vacuum. The basic physics of separating within that pressure still remain the same. So throwing a vacuum on it doesn't necessarily help. You could maybe condense the system down from four feet down to one feet. Yes, that's cool but you're introducing another uh, variable that you're going to have to then again, tightly control. And then also if you're doing it under vacuum, it gets a little weirder on the condensing end of capturing the alcohol. Alcohol, so yeah. Have the entire capturing that under the same vacuum in order to maintain your pressures through the system yeah. so that your temperature change at the top of the reflux column actually means what it does. 
I think the only reason for the lower temp the vacuum is to be is to do lower temperatures and supposedly preserve more terpenes. I think that's the reason why people do it. I guess. And that's valid. And and yes, setting a system up like that now you're talking Cadillac. That's totally valid. You don't have to, but yeah, yeah, that is that is. Cadillac. I understand. You still have to re. You still have to recapture the alcohol, which is just as difficult. It doesn't matter whether you do vacuum or temperature, or whatever. Yeah, and and if you're doing it's just the same problem. And if you're doing this on any kind of scale, go get some damn stainless. Don't kill yourself. You're you're evaporating off alcohol. Don't blow right. anything up. You can blow <laughs> yeah, yourself still up. Gonna blow up. You can do a flash fire with ethanol. I mean, I I haven't done it, but I've seen videos of it, and uh, you can absolutely. It's not as like BHO. You're not gonna blow the windows out of your room, but you're gonna you're gonna have a bad day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cops yeah. Yeah. spend the money now, and and just you're gonna you know, singe your money. eyebrows off. Yeah. All extraction to get to get into the game fair where you where you can say yeah I got some game on this. This is the cheapest arena to get into. Is some good ethanol extracting. Uh, it's the safest, but it's still a snake. Don't ever forget it's a snake. Uh, yeah, it can it's bite. I, yeah, don't ever forget that. <laughs> it blows, man. It really does. I have I, I raised teenagers. I know, shit blows. <laughs> Actually, we had a. <laughs> oh, never mind. I, I shouldn't talk of. We, we we had a one or two interesting uh, things happen with one or two of our experiments. No no fires or losses of pressure, but definitely one or two times where things were not not where they should have been. All hands on deck. <laughs> All hands on deck. Yeah, yeah everyone got all their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, we've never had any kind of accidents, but we've definitely had one or two times where it was like, uh, maybe we should uh, dial this back a little. <laughs> so, but um, it's always good. That's how you learn. You know, there, there's so Thank many cool you. things yeah. that people figured something, out. Something to be aware up. of is when you're playing with different pressures and different temperatures and liquids, and you're you're really trying to accelerate the the exchange rate off the surface of getting your solvent out of there, the, the product could do something called thumping. And thumping can make things go weird so fast. And all the stuff like the fluid dynamics and thermodynamics and trying to understand that is fascinating. And I'm really slow. It takes me a long time to get that stuff. And when the thing's thumping, you really don't have time to do the math. But it does get exciting. And that's the reason why you do it someplace safe because your ultimate response to your still is run. <laughs> There's a thing called a bump, a bump chamber, a bump pot, or whatever, right? Uh, well, it's, a, it's a part of a still. Pot. And what Bumper you're actually pot. doing there is you're in, introducing downstream from the distillation out of the mash. At that point, you're introducing like maybe like you're making a gin. Uh, and, and that's where you're putting your aromatics into the alcohol stream. So the alcohol's coming off is seeping through your aromatics pumper chamber and then going into your uh, collection uh, condenser. Oh, I thought it was to prevent the, that action of bumping, but it's not. It's to add the add smells. The, the, to prevent the thumping is really paying attention to uh, keeping things stirred generally. That's why you'll often see like you'll have uh, things in a heating pot that has this magnetic spinner in there. Uh, so you can do stuff like on a pretty small scale, let's say like 13 gallons or under, really pretty safe at home. That's that's pretty, pretty groovy. You start getting above that. Uh, you don't want something bigger than that to be your first rodeo, you know, because uh, because. While it's generally very, very safe, when it does go wrong, it goes really, really wrong, really, really fast. That's the problem. Uh, so, but there are there are some like a if you are doing a larger uh, setup, and but if you're like doing a mash, is one thing. Uh, you you could put like some rocks or something like that in the bottom uh, to make sure you're getting better heat distribution down there. But if you're doing your stilling where you're trying to capture the things you pulled out of your plant, 
you have to be really, really careful because you have to control your heat and your temperatures. Because like you can't have a, a direct heat source in contact with your collection bin at that point because you're going to start burning uh, the uh, the extracts that you're getting out of the plant. And you definitely want to do that. So if you're distilling for for cannabis extraction, it's it's actually a a whole nother extra uh, fun world. It's worth it though. Totally worth it. Cool. And and someone asked, you know, hey, I think I'd rather put that money towards a rosin press. And it's like, well, you could, but that's 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 we're talking about two different things. You know, a rosin press is for smoking and making rosin and all that, and this is for more for for doing edibles and and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Two different creatures. Medicinal. It's the yin yang thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and also, we originally got into it because we were talking about what to do with the chips, leftover chips yeah. from the rosin uh, pressing. Well, yeah, I was actually talking about using the, the rosin press for the whole thing. I mean, either way, the rosin press makes it so much easier to dose your edibles. Sure. Yeah. Yep. In fact, let me uh, go back to this here. Pull up uh, the aquaponic uh, Facebook group uh, by the way has been really growing lately i wanted to just say a big uh, thank you and shout out to everyone that just joined we've had 51 members in the last new members in the last week alone so wow. we're really wow. growing now <laughs> we hit some kind of tipping point and all of a sudden uh uh everyone's interested um but there was a really cool post um two seconds to find it here um on a guy um first off congratulations greece is going to legalize uh so congrats wow. to Greece. But there was a cool post on here by a guy from South Africa um, who was like, hey, like I, uh, I grow cannabis. I just started doing aquaponics. You know, I did aquaponics for a little bit and then I found your show and really inspired me to grow cannabis and aquaponics. And thank you so much. And he posted his um, his pictures of his first harvest on there. And I just thought that was so cool that like, you know, this guy's on the opposite end of the planet, like pretty much in every way, and and he's uh, learning from us and jamming out with us, you know. And, so and I, I love when that out. stuff happens. Yep. Yep, I love mm -hmm. it. I love it. I love it when a guy that was a sixty-year-old guy joins the forum and buys our seeds, and we teach him how to grow. He enters the butt of the month contest and wins. <laughs> you know, that, that is so cool to have that happen. You know, one love man it's cool that's why we do it You're, you know uh so we're not really getting rich doing this you know <laughs> maybe one day <laughs> hey I, I love people i was raised by humans as a child that's why i still do this stuff i heard it human beings see one race human beings see not colors, not Republican and Democrat. One fucking human race. Take care of the smoke. human race. As long as you smoke. If you don't smoke, yeah. we're pushing you off the raft, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, what about vape? What about those of us who like to vape? I'm flexible. I'm flexible. As he, he says as he twists the dude. What about dabs? In the dark. I I'm think it's the point that if you don't push them off the boat when you get to the island, they won't help you grow and process okay. the shit. So All right. You don't have to smoke, gonna be, you you don't have to smoke, but you can't tell me I can't. Uh. Okay, that's how flexible I am. Okay, okay. here we go. You can't tell me I can't. We win, Roger. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this guy just messaged me here. Uh, I think this is him. Yeah, so much know. for a short <laughs> show. <laughs> there's a there's a guy uh a guy shout out there's a gentleman who, who from uh new mexico as well who said he's been watching since uh episode three uh of the podcast which is uh 72 episodes ago so you know thanks for your continued support brother that's fantastic that's dedication yeah. that's better than my record yeah and only... as always, shout out to all the viewers that we uh, end up tuning in live, man. Y'all are awesome. Oh, hell yeah. And all the great questions and content. And, you know, at, what, three or four times today, someone asked a question and we ended up talking about some other, you know, in-depth topic. It's, you know, we love this and uh, 
who knows uh, if we keep having good content maybe we'll push the show to 10 normally instead of nine but uh we ended up starting late today too so Alrighty, so should we wrap up the show and then this, do you guys want to stick around and do an after show or you guys want to crash out this week? Well, I'm, I'm ready to beat my face into a pillow. Yeah, I'm, I I'm was pretty ready to up. beat my face in the pillow and we started the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, well, maybe we'll just call it this week and, and yeah. we'll get back next week when everyone's a little bit more settled. So I... thanks everyone for watching. Um, again, be sure to check out all of our stuff. Um, I'll have more um, stuff on my YouTube channel. I'll have uh, another update from The Grow when I get back on uh, probably Tuesday or Wednesday. I fly back on Tuesday, but I don't know if I'll feel like doing a garden video when I get back. So, um, uh, yeah, we'll have another, more updates next week. Uh, just out of town. So <laughs> that's why I'm not getting any. And, uh, yeah, we got some some other cool stuff in the works. Um, just working on building out a, a new grow. So that's going to be cool. So we'll have some. Again, more grow content coming up. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been very therapeutic after dealing with a bunch of licensing stress. So, that's <laughs> um, been good for the head, you know. So, all right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. And uh, thanks for everyone for watching. And um, we might do random updates over the weekend uh, from the uh, regenerative um, farming thing. Um, if anyone's around, there's also an event um, seven to nine each day during the event. I think it's only thirty-five bucks. So if you're working during the day and you still want to come visit and see Jeff Lowenfell and hear him talk a little bit in the evening, uh, I know they're kind of doing like a meet and greet kind of thing um, as well. It's a little more affordable if you don't have much money. So uh, definitely check it out. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, Charlie was supposed to come on. Charlie uh, uh, had something come up with uh, with family ag aggro. So uh, he wasn't able to make it onto the show. So I do apologize. Uh, we will get him on again next week. Um, so. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. And um, we will uh, catch you guys next week. Cheers. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Nighty -night. Mighty, night. Mighty fine plans you got there, Mr. Green James. <laughs>